Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy that we can have all of you with us today for this uh, movie workshop. These uh, movie workshops are designed to, to expand your perception. They are designed to allow for you to get in touch with emotions that have been repressed and denied from awareness. They offer uh, an interactive component, we call a breakout rooms, uh, later on where if you have emotions that come up during or after the movie, we encourage you to express those emotions and, and share freely because many people, including myself when I was growing up, we, I didn't really feel safe in expressing emotions. I felt like uh, my family, biological family system was not really uh, set up to have all the darkness uh, in my mind. And, and so it was much later in my life, in my late teens and my 20s, where I really allowed myself to cry and face all these really dark emotions. And I feel like that is a, a very big part of healing, spiritual healing. And that in cultures that basically uh, avoid emotions or stereotype roles that avoid uh, being in touch with emotions uh, through expressing them and being aware of them, that that is a, a big ego inhibitor for spiritual awakening. And nothing's going wrong when you have dark emotions. It's actually Jesus and yourself, your mind, in collaboration, allowing the emotions up so that you can, can heal and your mind can come right side up toward the light instead of being upside down and guarded and in denial of, of the light. So some of you know that the general metaphysics are basically saying that, that when the separations seem to occur, uh, the, the light was forgotten, a total amnesia, and the darkness was then pushed out of awareness too. And what we experience as the world is actually a dream world. It's a projection of unconscious guilt and hatred. Of, of unconscious fear. And you're all in for a treat today because I'm going to show a classic movie. I think of all of the movies I've ever seen, and I've seen thousands of them, I would call this A Course in Miracles made into a motion picture. I would call this A Course in Miracles uncut. A Course in Miracles Uncensored. And when I first saw this movie, when it came out in 1998, uh, I went to a movie theater and it was a spectacular experience for me. And yet, uh, it was the, the mainstream uh, was so unprepared for this movie that, uh, that I think after like two or three days, uh, it it left the theater. It, it was one of the shortest running movies in the mainstream theater I've ever seen because it kind of reflected uh, the famous line from uh, A Few Good Men, uh, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> this, was, this is a movie way ahead of its time for exposing the dynamics underneath this projected world. And I was reflecting, I was praying with Jesus and reflecting, and uh, I feel so grateful to be able to share this classic movie with you. Uh, it's, a, it's a Course in Miracles classic, uh, not so much a classic of the world, <laughs> like Gone with the Wind, but uh, I think if you really fully give yourself over to allowing the Spirit to use this movie, uh, then you can, you're on your first huge step to saying gone with the wind to the ego. <laughs> because the ego doesn't want you to see this stuff. This is, this is, for a mind awakening, this is a gem. But for the general population, this is a nightmare. 
I, I'm not such a fan of horror movies, and and I actually wouldn't consider this, from my perception, a horror movie. This is like, thank God, <laughs> this is this is what the mystics and saints have have been facing for generations. This is what uh, Saint Teresa of Avila was facing. This is what the poets like Rumi was facing. Uh, Saint Francis. Uh, all of them. Jesus had to face it. Buddha had to face it. Ramana Maharshi had to face it. And now uh, you're going to get a little taste of what the mystics and saints actually had to face in their journey to remember God. And so this is kind of a unique event that we have uh, hundreds of people around the world watching uh, a movie that will lay bare uh, the exposure of the ego. The world was made in hatred. It's not love that makes this world go round. It's actually the, the, it's the projection of anger and hatred that, that produced this projected world. This is the ego's world that you perceive a world of differences, uh, of separation, of pain, of suffering, of wars, of pandemics, uh, of murder, of vengeance. Um, and if you look at history from through the ego's lens, uh, you can see that, that the world reflects the ego belief system. Uh, I was watching a clip the other day from a very f another classic movie uh, that people sometimes say when they watch this movie they get the heebie-jeebies. Uh, but I, I don't. I like it. But it's called The Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino. And towards the end of The, the Devil's Advocate, Al Pacino is ranting and raving and raging. He, he plays the devil. He plays a good devil, uh, Al Pacino. But he's saying at the end, the 20th century was mine. No one can doubt that. And well, that's kind of an interesting claim. With world wars, pandemics, uh, uh, all kinds of corruption, slaughter, everything the world, uh, you know, it, it, it seems to be the most difficult, challenging things of the world. And the devil is claiming the 20th century was, was his. But I find it all quite humorous because, because once you get clean and clear in your mind of unconscious darkness, then you can actually have a gentle laughter with the Holy Spirit and Jesus at this world. But it actually takes mind training. You actually have to practice the course. You can't just hold it on your bookshelf as another theology among all the great ones, the Advaita Vedanta and all the great non-dualistic uh, teachings and approaches what Alex Huxley called the perennial wisdom. You know, you, you can't just put the Course off as another theory and expect to be able to have gentle laughter with this world. You actually have to go through what the mystics and saints went through. You have to go through the darkness to the light. You have to give your heart over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and let them carry you through the darkness to the happy dream, to the real world that he talks about in the Course, the, the healed perception. And if we want to put it in even a bigger context, uh, most of you are familiar with different fields of study in the world. I would say basically psychology is the study of the mind. Uh, and it has the theories and the study of the mind, so psychologists are those that theorize about the mind. And we've had a lot of amazing contributions from the field of psychology, all the way from Freud through, through Jung. Um, I mean, even way back, even uh, the father of psychology was William James. But we'll say from William James through the, the amazing uh, transpersonal psychologists like uh, Francis Vaughn, who passed away, he was a course student and her, her husband is still still with us, uh, Roger Walsh. Uh, 
there's, it's a field, basically, of the theory and study of the mind. Jesus actually is, is the master psychologist. Jesus does not give us postulate theories. This is the way and the truth and the life speaking in A Course in Miracles. Jesus does not theorize about psychology. Jesus offers the most amazing use of psychology, the, the actual direct use of psychology to get in touch with the power of your mind, which has been denied. We also have a field called philosophy, which is, the, I'll say, it's the study and theory of trying to come to meaning and understanding through beliefs and, and concepts. And again, the field of psychology has many, many great philosophers, you know, going back to the days of Socrates and Plato, the ancient Greeks, and many famous European philosophers. We have famous, famous tradition of philosophers. And again, Jesus is the master philosopher. He is not postulating or theorizing. When you read A Course in Miracles, you are getting a direct foundation for the escape from fear and guilt. So this gift of A Course in Miracles, maybe that's why you, you may seem to have resistance, as, as we talked about on the first night on Friday, because the ego is terrified of the light, and it's terrified of this course. So any resistance you have to this course uh, you know, is coming from huge resistance. There are even people that had devoted their entire life to uh, metaphysics and New Age and so forth that sometimes they, they're so frightened they flip and they throw the course in the garbage can or they throw it in, they flush it down the toilet. They, they heave it in the river. <laughs> they, they throw it in the ocean. Uh, they say, enough of that. That is, that is, uh, they sometimes will call it the work of the devil. I'll tell you, this Course in Miracles is, is a masterpiece of spiritual awakening. And it's, it's, it's the devil is afraid of this, this piece of uh, literature. But it's more afraid of the presence behind, the light behind the Course. Uh, the field of education, you know, learning. Uh, Jesus even named it a course in miracles, which is kind of a joke too, because it's about unlearning everything that you've ever learned. <laughs> it's not really about accumulating knowledge. It's about undoing and unlearning everything, everything that you've ever learned. And when we talk about religion, uh, again, I would say religion is like the, the study and the theory of the beliefs about God. And that's why many people have so many issues with religion. It's not that religion isn't the problem, it's just another group of symbols that can be used by the Holy Spirit and Jesus to take you home to God. I've met in my travels of 44 countries around the world over these last 25 years, I've met amazing, bright, sparkling-eyed uh, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Christians, uh, Zoroastrians. I mean, <laughs> I, have met, I have met so many different religious adherents. I've been in synagogues, in ashrams. I've, I've been in churches. And, of course, the basements, living rooms, backyards where people are there. I have had beautiful friendships with atheists, with agnostics. We're all the same. We're all the same one. We're all the same spirit, you know. Why not be friendly with everybody? Who cares what they believe in? I've got to the point where I don't even care. <laughs> I, I sit down and have a nice chat with somebody and they, I, they say, well, let me tell you what I believe about God. And they say, I believe in pink pyramids. Great. Perfect. 
We're the same one. I don't care if you believe in pink pyramids. I, I, I'm going to be as friendly with you whether you believe in God or you don't. You know, God is not a matter of belief. And that's where religion, you know, kind of gets bogged down into who's right and who's wrong about beliefs. And the ego invented all the beliefs. So don't try to get into comparing and contrasting beliefs. If, if you find a belief like forgiveness, true forgiveness, that takes you back to an experience of your union with God, that is amazing. That is spectacular. That is so wonderful. That's the whole point of all of this. So, I feel we have a movie today. Uh, it was made in Australia. It was put out in uh, 1998. And some of you remember the end of the millennium. The Truman Show. The Matrix. The 13th Floor. I mean... And Dark City is right in there. Uh, if you like The Matrix, this movie is side by side with The Matrix. Except it's, it even shows you more of the underbelly of the ego than The Matrix did. That's how good this movie is in Spiritual Awakening. It shows you the complete underbelly of the ego belief system. Some of you may say, I just am interested in love. I thought I, I signed up and registered for a free weekend retreat about the love of God. And you're talking about underbellies now. Yeah, I'm talking about underbellies. I'm saying that you don't approach, approach truth directly. You have to approach it through the undoing of what never was. You have to expose the ego for exactly what it is in order to experience the truth of who you are. You can't just affirm yourself into heaven. The ego actually laughs at affirmations. It's, it's, it just snickers at, at affirmations. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been doing positive affirmations. I can see you there, I know. I did it too. We tried to affirm ourselves back into the kingdom of heaven, and the ego is laughing. It's going, is that the best you can throw? Throw me a few more positive affirmations of love and light, and, and I'll see if you can get past me. And the reason is because you, you can't escape from something that you believe subconsciously to be true. And the subconscious mind was made by the ego as a, as a splitting off of the mind, a split mind, and to keep you unaware. What is the best phrases we can give to the unconscious mind? This is not something that you, you talk about often with your parents. Mom, Dad, how's your unconscious mind doing? <laughs> what? Are you going to be home for Christmas? <laughs> I don't want to hear about whatever that unconscious mind is. You know, we don't talk about that in our family. We don't talk about the unconscious mind. Actually, it's a very important topic. Uh, it, it would be a good topic for anyone to talk about. The unconscious mind, Jesus calls the unwatched mind. It's kind of like, it's the dream that you dream in secret. It's what you've pushed out of awareness and said, don't even want to go there. Don't even want to see that. Jesus in A Course in Miracles says the unconscious mind, the, the dream you dream in secret is, is draped with sin. And of course sin is just error. But it's draped with error. It's like pushed out of awareness error. It's just a mistake, but if, you're not, if you don't even want to be aware of the mistake, then how can you be free of the mistake if you push it out of awareness? And uh, last night was beautiful. We had the, the Holy Relationship Panel. That was beautiful, and that was one of the main topics in the Holy Relationship Panel was the private thoughts. The thoughts that you're afraid to share with your partner. The thoughts that, that you're afraid to even admit that you have. It's, it's darkness 
coming into awareness oftentimes is met with that's not spiritual I'm a, I'm a good person I'm a good girl I'm a good boy and yeah what is that kind of Loch Ness monster where's my little baton my, I gotta beat it down I'm gonna beat that but beat that monster down get my bataka sticks out and pound that thing down before it comes up again now Jesus is saying actually it needs to come up uh, you need to be able to look calmly upon the ego and see its nothingness. And that's what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are for. You pray to align with Jesus and the Holy Spirit so that you can look upon the darkest thoughts, the darkest beliefs, and see their unreality. That you can have the gentle laughter of the Holy Spirit when the darkest thoughts appear up in, in consciousness, in, in awareness. And this is going to be the key to allowing the Holy Spirit and Jesus to use relationships. Your only purpose for relationships is they are mirroring your, your unconscious hatred and guilt and fear. And th in that sense you need your mirrors. Don't, don't be trying to dismiss your mirrors so quickly with uh, my house is my house or my way or my way and, and and go off if you can't deal with the rules of my house you need to be appreciative of the mirrors of the relationships in your life because they're helping you get in touch with what you believe even if it's out of awareness they will help you get in touch with it so this is a fast track today. I this is the first time Jesus has had me show this movie to a large group of people all over the world. Usually, uh, I would show it to some friends that would visit me at my little peace house years ago, and it would uh, it would kind of peel their mind open, and it would start to crack their mind open, and. Uh, so some of you have heard about psychedelics and ayahuasca and some of the experiences people have had with that. We're not using drugs today, but I'm going to use a motion picture <laughs> that can help you open your mind to what you need to see. And if at any point in this movie, I think it's, a, it's a, a, an amazing movie, but if any point of this movie, if you have to turn the sound down or you have to step away, please be my guest. Um, this movie is, is like showing you the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence in a very direct way. There's some part of your mind that's actually praying to be shown what is blocking me from God's love the experience and the awareness and the feeling of God's love. There's a part in your mind that says, let me peer behind the curtain. Let me take a look behind the curtain. And if it's a little too dark in there, then just turn the sound off and watch. And if it's still too dark and you have too much emotions coming up during the movie, then uh, just take, just pause for a bit. Or or just glance at the movie screen and see when I'm back on. I'm your, I'm your happy coach taking you down into the unconscious mind today. Jesus and I are saying, you don't have to be afraid of the ego because you made it by believing in it and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. It's like, take, we have a come on my magic carpet ride today. I've got a nice carpet here and you can I'll hold your hand and we'll go down into the mind on our magic carpet ride I can show you the world and it's maybe not as going to be as pretty as that song but you will if you hang with me through this carpet ride you will be able to sing with me at the end a whole new world a new fantastic point of view no ego to tell us no. No, we're going for the light. We're going for the light. But you have to please keep your arms and your hands inside the carpet ride with me. 
do not try to get out off of the carpet during the travel through the unconscious mind. You know, you're, it's not a nice place to dwell. You just want to observe it. Just go on the ride with me. If I had enough time today, I, I probably would do the whole thing, but we have so much to do today. And there's a beautiful meditation with Kirsten coming tonight and a beautiful music meditation with Zach coming. So they only give me so many hours, so I'll do the best I can. Uh, but we're going to, you have a meditation coming tonight, and a, Zach is an amazing musician, music meditation, and Kirsten will take you. So if you can make it through the day, the unconscious mind with me this afternoon and morning, then you're going to be all set up for a nice med deep meditation tonight. So it's important to realize that the ego cannot hurt you. That's the main theme I want to emphasize during this opening to the Love of God weekend retreat. That's how you move into the celebration of illumination, is you have to transcend the darkness in that seems to be in your mind, and you soar high, high up into the light and, and back into union with God. It's, the ego is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, only the anticipation of looking will frighten you, but when you actually just, it's like Jesus is telling us all, take my hand and, and you can see what I'm going to show you. You can see what it is that you have to release. I talked about this yesterday when Francis and I were here. I was saying very simply what forgiveness is and the way to escape the ego and, and the split mind is simply to see the impossibility of attack. That's all you have to do is have one experience where you fully see the impossibility of attack. And I know you follow this because we talked about this yesterday. Why would a God of eternal love create attack? I mean, what would be the purpose of creating attack? You see, that's all of the ego. It's, it's false evidence appearing real. That's where fear comes from. It's a lot of false evidence appearing real. But the world of perception, the world that you think you see when you watch the television or you look out your window or you look around your room, the world that you perceive is an effect of the belief in attack. And the ego is the belief in attack. God has nothing to do with attack. Eternal love does not create attack. But you must look upon the belief in attack and see its impossibility. That's what forgiveness is. That's just the Holy Spirit and Jesus have one function for your mind. It's just to see the false as false. And when we go into this movie today, we're going to see the ego's false use of memory. Now I know you you can look back at your life and maybe some of you will tell me I had some really bad memories that I'm still dealing with and I've had some really good memories some very loving memories and I've had some really dark memories they're all false even the good ones are just shadows of the light and the dark ones are dark shadows so what you're dealing with, when you're dealing with good memories and bad memories, you're dealing with shadows and dark shadows. And admittedly, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are so good at using the symbols of this world, so they'll use the shadows to get you out of Shadowland. But basically, make no mistake that this world of time and space, this linear world, this linear cosmos is Shadowland. You're dealing with Shadowland. God didn't create Shadowland. The ego projected Shadowland to cover up itself, to keep it in the web, hiding in the mind, and keep you unaware of, of the ego. That's why the world was made, was a projection of anger, projection of hatred, projection of guilt, to keep you from knowing who you are as the living Christ. 
a perfect creation of, of a loving God. So we can say that there's a line in the Course that really will help you and uh, I guess I'll share with you the line. This is the line, you might want to even write it down because you'll need this, uh, keep this on the carpet with me. <laughs> Just one line from the Course, but please keep this on the carpet with me. You might want to write it down because you need something to hold on to. And, and here's the line. This is from Jesus Christ in A Course in Miracles. Until you are willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. I'll say it just one more time so you can keep it huddled to, to your heart while we go through this adventure today. It's just an adventure. Until you are willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. That's why we're watching this movie today. That's why we're, we're looking at a, at a pictorial representation of attack thoughts. And for many things in this world, we're not aware uh, that they are attack thoughts. Actually the ego is so clever and so ingenious that it has taken aspects of its projected world and it has made guilt attractive so that your mind would still be attracted and addicted to guilt without realizing that it was attracted and addicted to guilt. Remember, the positive memories and the negative memories, the happy memories and the dark memories are all shadows. They're all projections of guilt in the mind. There are some symbols that are very helpful and you've experienced some of those. Uh, a Course in Miracles, I, I call this a happy symbol. If my mind is going to project something, I'm grateful for this book. It's just a book. But if you, if you read it and you practice it, you activate the, the miracles in your mind. And you actually become a miracle worker based on your practice and devotion to the principles of this book. It's not, the words aren't anything special. They're, they're a very good use of words. The Holy Spirit and Jesus use these words amazingly. It's an amazing masterpiece in that sense. But it's also part of the projection, so you, in the end you do have to let go of the book as well. But this is our opportunity to, to look calmly upon attack thoughts and to realize that all of them are, I'll call them memory implants. Some of you may have been watching my Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment and the movie <laughs> The Island also uses uh, the concept of memory implants. Here in this movie today, we actually see what memory implants are and how they are used in terms of, of I'll call them associations, to keep the mind afraid. That's what the, the, the memory implants are used. They're, they're used to keep you feeling guilty, to keep you feeling afraid, frightened. And, and yet it's all part of an upside-down system of lies. In that sense, all memories are fake news. That's a, a phrase today. Everyone's trying to say, give me the real news. I want the fact. Just the facts, ma'am. Like, like in the TV show Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Well, God is a fact, and Christ is a fact, and the memory implants are not factual. So that's why we need help. We are, our sleeping mind is surrounded, is circumscribed in false memories. 
and false images. And that's why it seems to take such a devotion to wake up from this dream, is because all of the evidence surrounding the sleeping mind is projected by the ego. When you look at this world, to use a sports analogy, you're on the ego's playing field. Is it a home game or an away game? Away. <laughs> you're on the road. You've got a hostile crowd. And initially you think, wow, this crowd is not rooting for me to wake up. <laughs> They're trying to kill me. <laughs> Nasty away crowd. <laughs> Not playing on, on the home field in front of the home crowd. Oh, you're playing away. Now the angels are in your mind. Jesus is in your mind. All the mystics and saints. There's your home team. They're like cheering you on. Go, go, go. You can do it. You can wake up. But the ego has peppered the world with lots of dictators and tyrants and vicious looking creatures always trying to get you, get you, get you, get your attention. Don't look there. Don't look in that darkened glass. Okay. Guess it's time for me to get started with the movie. My my phone is telling me I need to hurry it up here a little bit. It's already ten thirty nine. So so here we go. We are going to start the movie. I'll take that as a prompt from Jesus. We're going to start the movie. And the movie's name is Dark City. So if some of you go on Google and start checking this out, and you go, oh hell, what am I doing today? I'm spending my Saturday with David in Dark City. But it's time. So we are ready. Stay on the blue, the blue little magic carpet. Do not, do not put your arms outside, stay on the carpet with me through this whole movie. And remember, you know, you have to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred in order to be free of it. That's what we're doing this for. This is not some bizarre kind of thing that I like to torture people uh, on their Saturdays when they get off from work. You know, this is, we're going to have some fun. And if I could, if I had enough time, I would show you some John Cleese clips uh, from the movie Man About Town. You, sh you need to have uh, stay with me in the Monty Python frame of mind today. I'm not showing you a horror movie. I'm showing you Monty Python could, could, uh, could make a good version of this too. In fact, I'm sure it would be helpful to the human race. But stay with me on the carpet. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Enjoy yourself today. Okay, what a start. Here we go. It, it, imagine you're watching any movie and it opens up with the main character, John. That's, that's a pretty common name. <laughs> Dear John. Uh, John Murdoch is, is our main character. Uh, his wife is Emma. He has a, a doctor, a psychiatrist, who's saying that John had visited him a few weeks ago, talked about their marital difficulties, and referred to... It, it's basically an infidelity, a betrayal issue. Uh, you probably have seen a lot of TV shows and movies that have these similar themes. Betrayal, infidelity. But the doctor's saying he suffered a psychotic break. What is a psychotic break? A psychosis is defined as in psychiatry, in psychology, as a break from reality. And all human beings have suffered a psychosis, a break from the kingdom of heaven, a break from nirvana, a break from reality. Uh, that's right. Heaven and nirvana, that is reality. That's oneness. That's eternal love. That's God. That's bliss. And so the human condition is what we could call, in psychological terms, a psychotic break from reality. Whenever you feel a little discomfort, psychologically or with your body, whenever you feel discomfort with 
society or politicians or anything in the perceived world. The issue is actually a psychotic break from reality. Not that it happened in truth, but if you believe it, then you suffer in experience from the belief in the psychotic break. So in just the beginning of this movie, this is why it's a Course in Miracles movie, it is a spectacular. You're not going to see a movie like this every day. You see those little unwind, those little spirals, you know, I have that same purple spiral on my, my book, Unwind Your Mind Back to God. Except uh, in this movie the spirals are everywhere. That's the Holy Spirit calling you back to the light, back to the forgiven world, back to the happy dream. We saw a little postcard of Shell Beach. And Shell Beach is, in this world, this is the, the remembrance, the symbol of the happy dream. It's, it's filled with light, it's filled with brightness. It's, it is the symbol in the, of the real world. And you can see that John Murdoch's already getting flashes of this happy dream, of this real world. This very bright, beautiful beach with the beautiful sparkling water and the bright sunshine. That's all symbolic of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. Forgiveness is the gateway back to eternity. And in this movie, the main character is starting to see flashes of this brightness. And that's very encouraging. That, that's there for all of us. Every time we have a glorious moment of, of a flash of remembrance, that's our remembrance of Shell Beach or of the happy dream. Also, we can see Emma. She's a singer. And uh, all the characters in the human race are dealing with guilt. But it's interesting that Jesus is telling us that the guilt is not coming from the behaviors. It's not coming from the behavior of, of what seems to be a betrayal or an infidelity. It's actually coming from the belief in separation. It's coming from the mind. All guilt, all anger, all hatred, all fear is generated in the split mind. And then the ego projects a world out where there seems to be actions and behaviors, there seems to be external, we'll call it causes and effects, that make a trap of guilt. So whenever you look back at your life and you think that you've done some very wrong things or very stupid things or things that you regret, those are projections of ontological guilt, of separation, of believing you separated from God. And in this world of time and space, that's how the trick works. The ego wants you to see the cause of the guilt as if it's in the images, as if it's in the appearances. Already John seems to, he was in the bathtub, he wakes up, and he's disoriented. He, he looks around like, what is this? There's a fish on the floor. He's wondering, Where, how did I get here? What is this? And I think some of you have had that same experience. Anybody ever wake up and wonder, how did I ever get in this mess of time and space? How did I get here? Last week we watched the, the movie uh, Down the Rabbit Hole and Michael Ledwith, the theologian, was saying, who are we? How did we get here? Where are we going? Well, that's what our John Murdoch's got a look on his face. He's, he's, he's naked in a bathtub. He steps out and he, he knocks this uh, thing over, fishbowl, he gets to save the fish 
you know, he, he, finds, he finds a world that he doesn't understand. And I think for most human beings, we can relate to John. Uh, it, it seems at times it's hard to reconcile our experiences of this world. Like, what happened? Why all these symbols of attack? Why all these symbols of war, of disease, of arguments and conflict and disagreements? How did I ever find myself in time and space? It's so dark. And of course, that's why we have philosophy, psychology, religion. I didn't even mention science is, is, is an attempt to discover the meaning and purpose of things too through experimenting on the world and yet this movie is showing us oh don't expect to get happy if you just experiment with these projections <laughs> your, your science, your Newtonian science you're going to still have the same questions in your mind how did it all begin? how did I get here? And how do I get out? <laughs> those, those are going to be really strong questions in your mind. Even if you preoccupy yourself with games, with distractions, with uh, worldly pursuits, worldly ambitions, those questions, who am I, how did I get here, and how do I get out of here, are questions that don't go away. Now, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are, are in our minds to reach us in a way. And, and in this movie, uh, it's beautiful. We have a husband and wife, John and Emma. We've met the, the doctor, Dr. Schreiber. Uh, we, we see that there seem to be these dark-looking creatures, dark human beings with these kind of these uh, all, all dressed in black, and we've seen some, some bloody knives already. We've seen uh, some a dead body. Uh, you know, we're starting to see some symbols of, of, of the ego's world. Basically, the ego made up the world to present evidence to keep you from knowing who you are. What, what does that mean? The ego has has peopled the world and filled this world with images of attack and defense, of victim, victimizer, of, of murder, of uh, guilt, basically. It's, it's made up a world that outpictures guilt. In other words, if it was, if it was like a, a, a courtroom, it's trying to present as much evidence as it can on the screen of the world for guilt, to reinforce the guilt. You know, let's take a specific example with John and Emma. Okay, they're married. Uh, one of the things of marriage is fidelity. Uh, one of the aspects of, of marriage is monogamy and fidelity. And it seems that Emma has, has had a, an affair and that turns into a marital issue. This is not surprising. What is important is to see that all of the memories, as I've said before, both positive and negative, are all projections from the ego. And the ego is going to use the projections in form to reinforce the feeling of guilt, the feeling of anger the feeling of, of hatred, because those are ego emotions. You're not going to wake up to heaven with anger. You're not going to wake up to heaven with, with guilt and, and shame and hatred. Uh, these emotions are ego emotions. The, they're part of the whole trick. The unholy trinity of sin, guilt, and fear. This is the unholy trinity of the ego. Of course, the answer is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We've got the, the Trinity that's helping us wake up from this nightmare of, of hatred and guilt, which is this world of time and space. And 
in this movie, he's going to have to be in, intuitive because he feels disoriented and he feels powerless. Does anybody else ever felt disoriented or powerless in the face of this world? I mean, that seems to be a standard for believing you're in time and space, disoriented and feeling of powerlessness and helplessness. And Jesus is saying, well, if you work with the Holy Spirit to be truly helpful, if you extend your light, if you extend your helpfulness, you will grow confident in that helpfulness. You will regain the remembrance of how powerful the mind is and how powerful the thoughts are. But if you use your powerful mind to believe in the ego and its projected world of time and space, hmm, you're going to feel weak, you're going to feel helpless, you're going to feel victimized by perceived circumstances, perceived remembered memories of the past that in truth never happened, that actually are all part of a system of guilt that has no reality in heaven whatsoever. To believe that you are in time and space is part of the trick. Even when you go through spiritual awakening experiences, I, I know myself and I know friends who sometimes have these amazing mystical experiences, but once the mystical experience ends, they look around like, what's this? What's, what's this? I mean, I, I've seen people that have looked at their, own, their body and just stared at it after a mystical experience, because it's like, what the hell is this? Because, because they have a glimpse of the light. They have a glimpse of the vastness beyond this perceptual world. And the ego's personal perspective doesn't, doesn't compute. It doesn't, it doesn't relate to the vastness of of reality, or even the vastness of forgiveness that approaches reality. So, John has got questions now, and the doctor, Dr. Schreber, is, is very similar to the helpers of the world, the, the psychologists, the, the counselors, the doctors, the, the social service workers of the world. They, they want to be helpful, but they can't truly be helpful because they believe in the same system. <laughs> you, if you need a counselor to help you out of time and space, you're not going to find it in terms of this world, except that they may be a reflection of the Holy Spirit. But actually, that's why we're told the Kingdom of Heaven is within. We have to use the power of prayer, the power of contemplation, the power of, of introspection, the power of meditation to find our escape. And the more we make contact with the Spirit, the more we're able to let the Spirit help us reinterpret the world from symbols of attack, from symbols of, of judgment, to symbols of awakening. We'll call them awakening symbols. You can't go from asleep into pure waking without having a bridge, without having a, a, a systematic way of starting to see the world differently. And so basically Jesus and the Holy Spirit are repurposing the world. They're saying, the world was made in hatred by the ego, but now we're going to give it a new purpose. We're going to give it a purpose that will light your mind up and bring you back to the remembrance of the light. We're all looking for Shell Beach. We're all looking for the Kingdom of Heaven. And there's a lot of postcards and there's a lot of been, things been written about the Kingdom of Heaven. But Jesus' teachings 
are coming from a place of actuality. For, for Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is an actuality. It's not a theory. It's not something where Jesus says, well, just hope. Hope? <laughs> In this dark city of a world, you're saying hope? And he's like, well, actually, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ho, ho, ho. Now we're talking. We're talking from a, a mind that is, is that experience of, of light, of pure light. And that's why when you call upon the name of Jesus and you call upon guidance from the Holy Spirit, you're asking to remember the light. You're asking for a complete awakening from the dream of separation and time. As you go through this movie, watch for the time symbols. Everything is about time. That's what the block to heaven is. It's time. We don't have to project it out onto tyrants of the world and dictators. We don't have to project the fear onto hurricanes and pandemic and tornadoes and storms. It's time. Time is at the bottom of this whole thing. Eternity and time can't coexist because eternity is real and time isn't. And that's what the holy instant is about. That's what Eckhart Tolle is speaking of when he speaks of the power of now. He's saying, right now, this is the gateway into eternity. It's covered over by a lot of false memories and false beliefs, but it's there. It's still there. So let's see how John navigates here. John is still in a, a state of disorientation. And, and the more you go down the rabbit hole of spiritual awakening, and the more that you trust to follow the Holy Spirit, you will have to move through periods of disorientation. Because it's just your mind loosening from the false beliefs of this world of thinking it already knows where it is and what it is. I want you to be able to, to really follow this and really see what it's all about. So we have a couple new characters. We have uh, Inspector Frank Bombstead, played by William Hurt. What are inspectors doing? What do police officers do? What did Sherlock Holmes do? Inspectors investigate. Right? They investigate. And this is our investigator character, Frank Walensky. He's the one who's assigned to solve the murder. He's the one assigned to figure the, the crime out. And we have that in our world. That's what our police officers, our detectives, our inspectors, our Sherlock Holmes, they are meant to solve the crime mystery. Columbo, <laughs> one of my favorite detectives, still he's trying to sort through the story to find out what happened, who the victim was, who the perpetrator or the victimizer was, and Jesus is laughing. He's like, now you've even peopled your world with, with characters that are supposed to solve the, the crime. But the crime isn't in time. The crime is not in time. The, the perceived murders, the, the robberies, the corruption, the destruction, that's all projected by the ego to make you feel bad, to make you feel helpless, to make you feel guilty. Even when I hear different speakers and teachers say, you know, God is a mystery. Well, yeah, to this world, uh, to this world of images, God seems to be very mysterious. In fact, if you talk to the atheists, they will say, yeah, there is no God, because the evidence of time and space seems to be so set up and so fixed for shame and pain and guilt 
that it seems to be a closed system. Now, Frank Bomstead, the inspector, he's, he's got his, his assistant, Hesselbeck, and um, who's working with him. But they're talking about another detective, too. And this detective is called Walensky. And they don't even know where Walensky is. But Walensky is a detective that's been kind of looking at all the crimes and all of the, the struggles of the world. And maybe like many of you, Walensky started to say, I don't know, it's like a closed system. Have any of you ever looked at this world and felt, this seems like a closed system? The evidence for darkness seems to be quite strong. Uh, maybe you don't watch the news. Maybe you avoid what seems to be going on every day, but actually there's something inside of you that's going, what the hell? <laughs> this, the evidence seems to be quite strong. That's why I have so much fun with atheists, because they, they've concluded that there is no God. But considering this world, that... <laughs> That isn't such a far stretch, because they, they would say, why would God allow such a world? Why would God create such a world? And if God had anything to do with this world, why would I want to even believe in God? Why would I want to, to, to be with that God, if God has any connection? And Jesus is basically saying, no, God did not create a meaningless world. God knows not form, Jesus says in the Beyond All Idols section, uh, later in the text. Basically, he's, he's saying the ego invented the world. And he even has lessons in the workbook to try to start to take, uh, to, to take some sense of um, responsibility. Not that we're supposed to hold on to it, but he's saying, I inv have invented the world I see. That's where he's starting to, to loosen us from this belief that we just showed up here through mom and dad, you know, the whole story of mom and dad and sexuality and intercourse and a sperm and an egg. What a, what a trick. There's a whole story to try to answer, how did you get here? It has nothing to do with the truth. Even that's a lie. <laughs> what? Mom and dad are, yep, that's part of the lie too. The entire perceptual world is a closed system of false evidence appearing real to convince you that you're something that you're not. To convince you that you're flesh and not spirit. Even though Jesus is teaching us before Abraham was, I am. Before this linear time construct, there is an I amness that is pure spirit. It's prior to the belief in time. It's not at the end. It's prior. You've got to go back to the beginning, to the original source, God, to, to find your true identity. And then the whole world is just a, a world of, of denying that identity. Now I want to bring up again um, Walensky. We haven't seen Walensky yet. All we know is, they don't know where Walensky is, but Walensky is a detective who's kind of tipped over the edge. <laughs> Who basically, he like, he saw enough of this world and he, he basically is now, uh, he's starting to talk about the closed system to his wife. He's, he's left his job. He's kind of like many people who go into spirituality, who kind of, they lose it. They, they go, I can't take it anymore. This, this whole world is too much. It's, whatever it is, it's too far. It's, it's, it's uh, I can't digest it. And that's what Walensky is our symbol. He's like, he sees that there's no way out. He's, he's a symbol of, of a mind that has given in to the voice of the ego and is basically suicidal. 
because he sees there is no escape in his perception. Jesus talks about this in the, in the real alternative section of A Course in Miracles where he says all of the world's roadways lead to death. All of them. And yet, he says, men, men have died upon seeing this. This is our Walensky. <laughs> this is why it's A Course in Miracles. It's like all the characters are playing out what Jesus talks about in his course. Walensky is, is a symbol of men have died upon seeing this, that all roadways of the world lead to death. And yet if they had just gone one step further, Jesus says, beyond this despair, existential despair that Nietzsche was talking about, once they have gone, they go beyond it, they will be lifted to heights of happiness. That's our Shell Beach. That's our forgiven world. That's our happy dream. And yet, Walensky is one of those inspectors, detectives, that has been weighing the evidence, and he's come to a point of despair, that, that everything is circular, that there's no way out. In fact, he's even tried to make it to Shell Beach, like many people have. Many people for centuries have talked about heaven and nirvana, but for them, it seems to be an unattainable goal. Whereas, again, for Jesus Christ, this is not an unattainable goal. This is actuality. This is isness. This is, this is what's true. This is what's real. Light is real. The perceptual world, as I talked about last, last Saturday, is, is just a projection to keep you from the present moment. And then, at the very end of that last scene, we saw he goes into like a, a, a place where they, you can get food or things behind this, uh, these little glass things, almost like a, a laundromat of things. And he's forgotten his wallet. He doesn't even remember when he forgot it. He's, he's not clear on time. Uh, he's, he's kind of beginning to wake up, so he has a bit of psychic powers. He, he sees the wallet behind the glass, and he just looks at it, but he wants to get the wallet, and then the power of his mind opens the, the little thing so he can take his wallet. He's, he would like to see that wallet because maybe there's some identification in it. He's not sure even if he's John Murdoch. He's not sure what he is. He's not sure what time it is. He's in the middle of a spiritual awakening where even his psychic ability, in parapsychology they call it psychokinesis, where you can seem to move objects with the power of your mind. He's starting to get into his psychic abilities which are reminiscence of his powerful mind that all of us share, the Christ mind. And he's starting to tap into these psychic abilities. In this movie it's called tuning. That's a good word, tuning. You're, you're tuning with the Spirit, tuning with the Christ, tuning. You're, you're aligning your mind with the power of strength of the light that you are. And now that's coming out in the world of projection as psychic abilities. Some people seem to have psychic abilities. Jesus tells us these are very natural. You're just starting to remember who you are. They're not unusual at all. They're, they're actually predictable. As you start to take the limits of belief off of your mind, your mind starts to return to its powerful nature, its light nature. So that segment we just saw is very important because John Murdoch is a symbol. He's beginning to wake up. He has lots of witnesses of evidence around him, uh, of planted evidence, planted by the ego to make him feel guilty. There's a murderer loose. He, he's just uh, met a prostitute uh, in the, the little kind of... Uh, 
I almost want to call it like a laundry mat, but it's like a, a place where you can go and get all these things. He's met a prostitute. She said there's a killer loose. She's telling the police, why don't you go out there and look for the murderer, the killer? And yet all around John are witnesses of guilt. And that's what's helpful to see, that the ego has made up the memories and made up the, the scenarios and the images to keep the mind feeling guilty. That's, that's all it does. It's a death wish. What would you expect of a death wish except to, to try to keep you feeling guilty? If your divine innocence is the reality and the ego is a denial, of reality, then you see the ego has set up a world to keep the mind feeling asleep and guilty. And that's what John is dealing with. He, he's trying to make sense of things and he's starting to realize that he doesn't really know who he is, but he is continuing to move forward with, with a sense of um, hope in his heart to find find the escape. Okay. So if you read the cor Course in Miracles, Jesus says that this whole world that we perceive rises out of from a, a ring of fear in the mind. And Jesus is telling us that that Everything that humans perceive as solid, you know, bodies and world and mountains and streams, the whole world is, is a projection coming from an unconscious belief in the guilt. So this projected world of distortions and seeming separation arises from a belief system in the mind. And yet, he says, you only see the second part. You don't see the dream that you dream in secret. You just perceive the second part, which is the dream, he calls it the dream you gave away. So, the ego is so sneaky that it, it divides the world up into a perceptual world, which is a dream that seems like you have nothing to do with. Like you came to the world uh, apart from your mind, you just happened to show up as a human being as part of a long historic world of time and space that seems to be very solid and real. But you don't see the part that you have in making it, which is the unconscious mind. And he says that's the dream that you dream in secret. Now in this movie, we've just seen the underbelly. We've, ju we've just been taken down into this symbolic unconscious mind with all of these dark figures. Those are our attack thoughts dressed up. <laughs> They've got, they all wear black. Kind of like in the Matrix. <laughs> Neo, Neo wears black. It's a pretty dark world there too. And this is a world of time. So, I don't know if you noticed down there in the, the dark where all these dark uh, creatures are, these dark people, but they had a mask. They're, they're all there, and then there's this giant mask there, and that is a symbol of the ego using the mask to cover something you're going to discover what is underneath that mask and that will help you realize what you have to face. That will help show you what you have to look straight upon behind the mask. Because the world, the projected world of time and space is like the, the surface of the mask. But there's something underneath that you don't realize is there and is accepted as real, that is really the issue. This is uh, the ego's guarded secret. Uh, behind the mask is, is what the ego is hiding from the mind. 
because the ego doesn't want the mind to discover its true nature from God. It wants to keep the mind trapped in a feeling of guilt and shame and a perception that witnesses to that guilt and shame. So now we're, we're getting a few clues. Uh, the attack thoughts don't like to be around moisture. <laughs> what does this mean for us? Well, what is water symbolized uh, in this world? I know. Spirit. Yeah, spirit and is is water washing, cleansing. I think uh, my so-called uh, astrological sign was Aquarian, the water bearer. Uh, water is fluid. It's uh, it's transparent. Uh, it it's been used in symbols like baptism. What was the baptism about Jesus about? It was about. It was about being born again. Some of you remember when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, then he said, this is the Messiah. This is the one. And the, the dove came down from the sky and landed on Jesus' head. And then the voice from the heavens said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Oh, we've got a lot of symbols with water because water is a symbol of the, the cleansing of the mind and of the return uh, to the remembrance of spirit, remember, remembrance of God. So in our movie here, Dark City, the, uh, the attack thoughts <laughs> from the unconscious mind, they don't like to be around the water uh, because they call it moisture. So unfortunate, we have to come to seek you out with this moisture. <laughs> they don't even call it water, moisture. Moisture is not, for something that's dry, <laughs> moisture is the end of the dryness. <laughs> and you might say, if we've been dry and, and our mind has been thirsty for light, thirsty for spirit, thirsty for love, the, the moisture is the symbol of, of the Holy Spirit, the symbol of Jesus. Now, uh, Murdoch, is, he's kind of staying away from uh, Frank Bobstead, Inspector Bobstead, because Bobstead had a gun, was trying to uh, take him in, arrest him. But he's following the doctor, and many of us have followed doctors. Has anybody here ever gone to doctors? You know, looking to, to ha handle your ailments? Uh, the doctors don't know. Uh, they, don't know what the, they don't know that the sickness is coming from ontological guilt in the mind and that their entire profession <laughs> is based on the belief in causation of the world and the causation of the body you know, the inner workings of the body, the blood, the, the brain, the neurological system. It's all a projection. The ego invented the body, the ego invented the medicine, the ego in, makes up the symptoms, and, and then the ego, even with the removal of symptoms, there's still the context of the body. And that's why uh, Jesus talks about in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, he says, only salvation can be said to cure. Well, we better run that one again. What? What's he saying? Only salvation can be said to cure. What's he talking about? What's salvation got to do with a headache or a, an, a heart condition or cancer? Well, the seeming symptoms and the body and the whole world of time and space are part of a projection to convince the mind of its littleness, of its frailty, of its shame, of its guilt. And only salvation, only the atonement, only the correction in the mind will bring about the cure. 
Have you ever noticed that with diseases like even polio, where they end up having a polio vaccine, or they come up with different cures for various things. That's what they're working on right now in terms of the medical model, is they're working for vaccine and cure for COVID-19, a, a, a medical cure. And Jesus says cure has kind of a, a, a mixed uh, a mixed meaning, a mixed connotation in the world that you perceive because even when you seem to come up with cures for diseases, then new diseases come. And then you try to invent new cures. Somebody was telling me recently that they said, well now there's so many variants of COVID-19 that now there's more variants than the original. It's, it's run amok. I, I heard an epidemiologist say, COVID will be with us forever. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that's popular. I'm sure that's going to go over big in the dream world. How many years did you say? COVID-19 will be with us forever. I'm like, okay, well, there's another uh, epidemiologist that's going to get fried. <laughs> People don't like to hear that. Forever. Oh my God. But Jesus is saying, listen, it's finite. Don't worry. Even if it's a few hundred thousand years, it's still the same. Time is your problem. Eternity is reached in the present moment and the future is a defense against the present moment. And the past is a defense against the present moment. And you need to just follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit to escape the belief in linear time. Time is underneath this whole thing. I remember when I was growing up, I would hear cliches. Don't you love these cliches of, of the world? Time heals all wounds. Has anybody ever heard that one? Time heals all wounds. And Jesus has one slight correction to make to that, to make it helpful. Jesus is always correcting even the cliches of the world he's got a correction for. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's use of time heals all wounds. You see? See the little tweak there? It's the Holy Spirit is the key. The Holy Spirit's use of time is kind. It would be too frightening to wake up if you've been so accustomed to the shadows of darkness. It's too frightening to go into the light immediately and directly. So a plan of awakening that involves miracles, that involves time collapse, that involves washing away the, the belief in linear time, that is what the plan of awakening is. And it's, some people say, I don't, I don't want a plan. Just, I want a snap my fingers plan. That's what I want, Jesus. You give me a snap my fingers plan. I'm, re I'm ready right now. And Jesus is like, you're too afraid. Even in Plato's famous cave analogy, when one of the prisoners escaped and got outside to see the light, the fire, the light, and the marionettes, when he came back in, um, they killed him when he came back into the cave, because he was talking about this light and these puppets, and they thought, oh, he is loco, he's crazy, and they killed him. Jesus says in the Course that prisoners who have long had their eyelids closed, he's talking about symbol for sleeping and dreaming, do not just rise up. Uh, they need a, a gentler dream before they can wake up from the dream. You don't go from nightmares into awakening, into the light. You go from nightmares to happy dreams to awakening. You see? So he's saying you have to have a happy dream first and then he describes it using a symbol of a body. He says their eyes are still shut but a smile has come on their face. Now they dream happy dreams. So he's, he's telling us that that's the way this is going to go. Don't, don't just think 
it's just going to be light, light, light until you have a gentler, happy dream come. And then he even goes on to describe what that dream is. It's a dream of non-judgment. You, you just simply have to learn to behold the world without judgment, with the Holy Spirit, and then you'll wake up. Uh, that's the whole goal. That's why Jesus taught during the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, judge not, lest ye be judged. In modern terms, I'm just going to reinterpret that and say, have a happy dream, and then you'll wake up. <laughs> judge not, lest ye be judged. Have a happy dream, and then you'll wake up for sure. He knows, because this is an actuality. This is not a hope. This is not like a it might happen. He's saying, no, it's a definite. Judge not, forgive, have a happy dream, and then you wake up. So he's giving us the whole thing. Now in our movie, uh, our main character, John Murdoch, he's going around, he's following the doctor, he, he was there in the pool, pool room, uh, hiding, but he's slowly wanting to confront his doctor. I'm sure some of you people have also wanted to confront your doctor. <laughs> or your dentist. <laughs> yeah, The parable of David, oh my God, so many fillings. In this. Confront the dentist, no, no, Jesus is like, confront your unconscious guilt. <laughs> what? You mean it wasn't the, the candy that... No, he said it's guilt. Why do, why do bad things happen to good people? unconscious guilt. Even the mystics and saints can tell you stories of all that they had to go through. What was that? Unconscious guilt. Unconscious guilt is at the bottom of it all. It, that is behind every single perceived problem. That is behind every discomfort, all pain, all pleasure, all dualistic experiences of this world, the good, the bad, the so-called right and wrong of morality and ethics, all of it has a pool of unconscious guilt. And here you see a movie, you're actually watching a movie that has this dark unconscious portrayed as these uh, characters dressed in black. Don't you love it too? It's, it's very basic down there in the unconscious mind. Mr. Book, Mr. Hand, Mr. Wall. Can you imagine telling, t calling your wife or your husband? Okay, Wall, come on in here. Mr. Hand, you know, it, it's so basic <laughs> that it's very impersonal, kind of still personal, but kind of impersonal. I don't know if I'd like a nickname, The Hand. Okay, uh, can we be a little more friendly here? The hand, Doc, Mr. Hand, Mr. Book, Mr. Wall. So that's the unconscious mind, but you, we are so privileged to see a movie that's showing us the unconscious mind. This is not like a Hollywood blockbuster. It's a, it's a living miracles blockbuster. <laughs> you are getting to see a living miracles blockbuster, but believe me, this is not a Hollywood blockbuster. I think for some of these actors, like Rufus Sewell and everything, I think that probably was a step back in their career. <laughs> they had, he's in a couple of other good mind watchers, though, uh, uh, in our movie watchers' guide to enlightenment. But this is not like your career uh, expanding kind of movie. But for us, Thank you, Jesus, for an unconscious mind movie that shows us the trick of what the ego is trying to pull over our eyes. It's invented a whole false world of time and space to keep us from knowing that we're one with God. And now we have your great tool here, A Course in Miracles, and even more so, our heart's desire is saying, yes, I will use your tool to find the escape hatch. I will, I will remember that I am one with God, like you showed the way. You're just giving me an instruction manual. I got this instruction manual in 1986. That's why I'm so happy. 
because I decided not just to read it and study it, but I decided to follow it. And oh my, if I could tell you some parables of miracles. I've had so many years of miracles, I can't even, there wouldn't be a book big enough to put them in there. But it's because that's our destiny, is first to be miracle workers and learn how to forgive, and then to accept the atonement and then to wake up. And that's the only game in town. Forgiveness is the only game in town. Isn't that nice to know there's only one game? Uh, if you're going to play any games, instead of playing Monopoly, or instead of playing, what was that card game, War? <laughs> you know, is poker? No. This is the only game in town. I'll tell you, this is the only game in time and space. And that's the game in our mind, rediscovering our mind, how powerful it is. We can tune. We can tune. Really, we can tune like, like John Murdoch. And, and you notice how the attack thoughts are afraid of the power of the mind. They want to keep injecting with these little syringes these false memories. And that's what the ego does with all of the humans, all they are are representations of false time and space memories. Don't necessarily, you know, don't try to have this conversation with your mother unless she's really tuned in here, you know. Mom, we do have Marina's mother showing up here on all these. Uh, there, there are those that are ready, that have the ears to hear. but. You know, this is for you, this is for your mind to experience the gateway to the Kingdom of Heaven. This isn't for, for people, this is for the mind to behold. So let's see what happens here. Now he's just, he's just ready to have a conversation with his, his psychiatrist. And I know uh, a lot of you probably have had a, a conversation with your psychiatrist, but I think you can see it goes much deeper than what's on the surface of typical psychiatry. Okay, some of you have heard about the Big Bang uh, that the scientists talk about. Some of you have heard about the, the fall from grace that's described in the Bible in Genesis. Here we come, in this scene, is a graphic prediction. It's, a, it's showing the projection of a world from the unconscious mind. That mask that all those little attack thoughts are giving their allegiance to <laughs> and lining up to use their telepathic powers is a symbol of the ego projecting time and space, projecting cities. Uh, most of us, when we think of cities, we think of um, buildings. Cities have buildings, but we think of people building those. We think of, of bricklayers and, and surveyors and construction workers. Uh, we think of, of concrete and steel and glass, and we think of humans building the built world. But this movie is actually showing the projection of the world, of the city, we'll say, coming from the mind, from the subconscious mind. Again, you're not going to see movies that show the making of the world from the mind. Uh, if you want to watch the History Channel, you can watch the ego's version of how things seem to evolve and come about. Even Darwin talked about mutations uh, that he called them uh, like seemingly meaningless mutations that, that starting with a single cell in dividing, the amoeba dividing, and then eventually we have animals and human beings and, and we have biological life. Uh, in The Matrix they talk about an anomaly and we talk about an entire generated uh, cosmos and, and time and space of mutations, basically anomalies and mutations um, that seem to reinvent themselves and, and do one version of the matrix and then another and yet another and so forth. 
Here, we are watching a movie that's actually showing the the belief in separation, the dark mind, projecting a world of buildings and streets and people, and then the dark ones injecting the, their uh, vaccinations, we'll call them, <laughs> their, their false memory uh, vaccinations coming from these little uh, flask and, and needles, and then mixing and matching different Memories, different people, like uh, Eddie Walensky discovered. She's not my wife. I don't know who she is. I'll just wake up dreaming another dream and, and be somebody entirely different. That's the description of reincarnation that the Buddhists talk about, or that many spiritual uh, philosophies talk about. But we're seeing here the projection of attack thoughts into a projected world that is there part of the deception to keep the mind unaware that it's dreaming. Uh, Jesus says, you may have thought of many things for as causes or reasons for the things that you experience in your life and in this world. The one thing you never thought about though was your own guilt, was the, the guilt in the mind. That's why it's unconscious, is because it's out of awareness, it's, it's a secret. And he says you've been keeping this secret going as if you don't want to be aware that you're doing this to yourself. But the belief in separation is an attempt to do guilt to yourself. And Jesus is basically saying, it's not true, it's not real, but until you first, you can accept that I have done this thing and it is this that I would undo, then you simply are, are living out a dream world and forgetting that you're dreaming. So the key is to be aware of the ego and to release it to release all attack thoughts from the mind. That's what Lesson 23 is in the workbook. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. It's really that simple. That's what forgiveness is. But as long as you just focus on the outcomes and the effects of the world, behavior, situations, events, without going into the mind, then you're just fooling yourself. One of the biggest distortions with A Course in Miracles is that Course in Miracles students will go around and just pronounce to everybody, their mother, their father, friends and family, the world's an illusion. Well, it's not dispelled by the words. Uh, telling your mother or your dad that the world's an illusion is not how you free yourself from the trick. You have to actually do the forgiveness. You have to go into your mind. You have to, to allow those emotions to come up. That's why we have expression sessions in, in our co-living and in our, our centers. That's why it's so important to have allowance and permission for those emotions to come up. Because how are you going to release something that you're not even allowing yourself to be aware of? You have to be aware of it. When you get upset, don't just push it down in awareness and try to uh, hold on to some belief that you're a good person. You've got to face in the mind what is believed to be true, what is assumed to be true and real. And then once you are able to really take a look at it with the Holy Spirit, then you're, it's, it's gone, it disappears, it fades away. So. We are now about to witness, I think this is probably the first motion picture, maybe the only motion picture in the history of the world that is showing the projection of darkness into generating a false world of people and buildings. This is a, a very rare scene, so I hope you're staying on the, on the carpet with me while you watch this one. <laughs> So, 
This is very strong um, symbology. Uh, with the world asleep and everybody seemingly falling asleep, they seem to be unaware of, of the changes that are happening in the form. They seem to be unaware of the changes of their roles, of their circumstances, changes in everything um, during sleep. And what this is showing us is that that it is the mind that has projected what is perceived. It, it actually has not left the mind of the thinker too. Ideas leave not their source. So all of this ego game of time and space, people, roles, cities, uh, cultures, uh, seeming development over the centuries, human development, all of it is in the egoic mind. It's all in false imagination. It's all a trick made by the ego for one reason, to keep you from knowing who you are. Everything of time and space has been invented, fabricated by the ego. It's fictitious. This isn't the only movie to talk about this. There are other movies in our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment like uh, The Island. Um, in The Island they talk about memory implants. Um, and in this movie you, we have, it's a graphic representation of memory implants where they're literally using a syringe and a needle and putting it in, in people's foreheads. But all of it's done during the sleep. So, if you take a moment to just stop and look at the body, for example, you can see that this body is nothing more than a projection of mind. What caused the body but the belief in it? And what is under the belief in the body except the belief that I can make myself as I wish to be. Some of you remember the Wonder movie, Wonder Woman movie from yesterday. It was a wish. There was a wish that she could have the partner that she wanted, who had died. And uh, the, played by Chris Pine, Steve. And, and that wish brought on weakness, it brought on chaos, it brought on uh, a crazy world. And that's what the ego is. The ego is a wish to create yourself apart from the way God created you. God created you as Christ, as pure spirit, and the ego is the wish to be something else. And, and the flesh is just a concretized form of this wish. In our movie here, Dark City, everyone's asleep the telepathic attack thoughts uh, are worshiping together a mask, and what's behind the mask? Time. They're worshiping time, which is what made them. The belief in time and attack thoughts are synonymous. And then the entire projected world of, of cities, of people, of different scenarios, some call it reincarnation, it's all one instant. It's not happening over millions of years. It's all one instant. And the key is, is do you want it? Because if you want to be separate, that means you want to use the power of your mind to make up something that's not true. And believe me, time and space is make-believe. It's completely fictitious. But it starts with a wish. Truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire as it was lost by your desire for something else. You see, it all starts with the wish for separation. It starts with the desire for separation. The desire to be something else other than what God created. And then from that wish, an entire cosmos emerges. 
the city that you believe you perceive is from that projection. The body that you perceive is from that projection. And all the characteristics of that body, whether it's health, you call it health, or sickness and symptoms, all are being generated from this unconscious mind. This is what Jesus says, he calls it the dream you dream in secret, and then the dream that you gave away. The perceived world on the surface of consciousness is the dream that was given away. That's the, that's the face of innocence, Jesus calls it, that is wet with tears at all the injustices of the world. But what if there aren't any injustices in the world? It's all just guilt, unconscious guilt projected as if it's taking a form. I, oftentimes I, I bring up that uh, little tape I was listening to many years ago where somebody on the tape was, it was a, a session that Ken Wapnick was doing and somebody on the tape said, uh, what does the Course say about life on other planets? And Ken says, the Course says there's no life on this planet. <laughs> Smoke that one in your pipe. So, why are we so concerned about, like with abortion, when does life begin? <laughs> Believe me, it has nothing to do with time and space, because life is eternal. Eternal love and light, that's what life is. Life is eternal. God created life eternal, and it's still as God created it. It hasn't changed. Eternity is still eternity. Reality is still reality. But we're seeing in this movie the attempt to invent something that is not compatible with the human soul, we'll call it the eternal soul, the spirit. This world is, is a generated cover over the truth. Even in the Matrix, uh, Neo asked Morpheus, what is truth and, and what, is, what is the Matrix? Is basically he's asking uh, Morpheus, and Morpheus says, the Matrix is the world that is pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. And then Neo says, what is truth? And again, Morpheus gives him the most helpful answer. He doesn't say, the truth is Christ, the truth is one. He says the truth, he says that you are a slave, Neo, a slave that what you can, of what you cannot feel or taste or touch. A slave to a prison for your mind. You see how helpful Morpheus is? Morpheus is not telling him that he's love and light. He's first telling him, you are a slave to something that you can't even perceive. Why can't you perceive it? Because the ego is a belief in the mind. The ego is not in form. The ego made form. And now we're seeing in this movie the unconscious mind and the projections that come out of that unconscious darkness. So this movie is like divine, this is metaphysics to awaken with. This is, this is not actually a movie, this is an instruction from Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of reaching the escape hatch in your own mind and finding the truth within, the kingdom of heaven within. So we are like honored and really privileged to to be shown so directly, so graphically, with so much illustration <laughs> that Jesus is painting the picture saying, here's why you need to have mind training. This is why you need to have a devoted life. He's saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and take no thought for the morrow. What did Jesus mean 2,000 years ago when he said, take no thought for the morrow? Put no thought into what you shall wear or what you shall eat. Do not go after the thing that the pagans go after, which is the ego, basically saying, why would you 
strive for fame? Why would you strive for money? Why would you strive for personality self-improvement? Why would you strive for the things of this world to try to make a better false self when God created you perfect? And you still are. You're perfect right now. Why would you strive to better yourself when you already are perfect right now, in this very instant? So the time, the time, the clock, and all the clocks in this movie, and the mask that covers over the clock, is basically the ego trying to keep the mind asleep because it doesn't want it to know that there's something more. It wants you to look at the body and go, oh, here's a body, and it's grown after so many years to a certain age. No. Uh, well, the body, where did it start? Well, it came uh, from mom and dad. That's where the body came from. No. It, it developed over time. No. It's a projection. It's a projection of a false idea. It's a projection of a belief system. And now you can give it over to the Holy Spirit to let the Holy Spirit use it. Smile through it. Laugh through it. Extend words of comfort and wisdom. Teach that what is to come has already happened. Well, that's a fun use of the body. Wouldn't you love to teach that what is to come is already over? That you're just reviewing mentally what has already gone by? That's the use of words that I don't think, any, I didn't think of that use of words. That's got to come from the Holy Spirit. I actually haven't ever told my mom or dad in time and space that we're just reviewing mentally what has already come by. And what is to come has already passed. You know, but here we are. We're here for a purpose to wake up. So those words are coming now because we're ready to hear them. We're ready to, to be shown our way back to eternity, how to remember God. We want that so much in our heart that that's why we're watching this movie together today is because we want to wake up. We want to remember the truth. So you're starting to see that that what is believed to be a human being is is basically a memory package. It's it's a story based on memories. Invented memories. Egoic memories. The ego invented time and space and it peopled the world with its projections. And that's why all spiritualities draw you to the present moment. All authentic spiritualities ask you to be still and sink down beneath the thoughts and memories and beliefs in the mind. And Jesus' workbook has workbook lessons designed exactly for that. Where he says, sink down beneath the, the riotous, rush, raucous sights and sounds of this world into the kingdom of heaven. When you try to discover your identity based on time or memories of time, you may actually consult family members, like John is doing in this scene. He is looking for his uncle Carl, because he wants to find Shell Beach. And in this world, the mind can look for people, it looks for avatars, it looks for saints, it looks even for teachers, but ultimately it can only find out who it is by going within. That's why prayer and meditation is so important in all spiritualities and in many religions. 
If you go to like Uncle Carl, you're looking to to biological family, genealogy. But even this will only show you the past. Because everything of time and space is part of the trick. One time Jesus was giving a talk and and in the talk his biological mother appeared at the at the talk and the word passed to to the, through the crowd your mother's here his mother's here his mother's here and they finally told Jesus in the middle of his teaching uh, that mother his mother Mary was was in the audience but instead of stopping the the talk to say hold on here Mom is here. <laughs> he actually said, Who is my father, mother, sister, brother? He that does the will of our Father in Heaven is father, mother, sister, brother. He was teaching love everyone equally. Don't love anyone more or less. Because these roles even father, mother, sister, brother are generated from the ego. He was saying, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all else shall be added unto you. And this is why you might have watched the, the Holy Relationship panel last night and I think Eric and a few, and Linda, Pete, Susan, they mentioned these roles outgrowing roles, loosening the mind from the roles. Why is that so important? It's because the ego generated these specific roles to keep the mind guilty. I wasn't a good enough child. I wasn't a good enough mother. I wasn't a good enough father. Somehow I didn't, I didn't do well enough in my, my personality role. And Jesus is saying, yeah, well, that's all right, because you're not that personality role. You're the Christ. You're an eternal creation of a loving God. And in heaven, that's all that there is. That's reality. You've been dreaming that you're guilty. You've been dreaming that you're in a far place in time and space. You've been dreaming you did things right and wrong and that you feel guilty for all the wrong things. But it's in your mind. You're asleep. You forgot heaven. And that's why you seem to believe you're, you're guilty. Jesus tells us you are guilty in time but not in eternity. And the only way to be free of guilt is to forgive the world, forgive the memories, the false memories, and to wake up to the eternal nature of God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that good news? Isn't that the good news of the gospel? <laughs> the, the gospel that Jesus was teaching. It's so wonderful to know that we are innocent. And it's so wonderful to be reminded that we are innocent in eternity. And we only believe that we are guilty in time. Linear time and guilt are synonymous. The present moment is the way beyond. So, also, I want to bring up at this point that Jesus says in the Course that, that the world is backwards and upside down. That's, that's what this projected world is. Backwards and upside down. Backwards in the sense that it seems to have causation when really it's just an effect of, of an unreal cause, the ego. And upside down whereas the projected world seems to have reality and the light of God is unknown. 
So the light of God is completely pushed out of awareness and now the projected world seems to be what's real, the known. And God is now the unknown. When in fact only God can be known and only Christ as your true nature in God's mind can be known and the world can never be known. You can't fix the world because you'll never be able to figure out the world. You can't ever understand the world. And it should be good news to know that you cannot understand this world. That you can let the frustration go. You can just practice the workbook lessons. Nothing I see means anything. I do not know what anything is for. <laughs> you can see there's a lot of lessons that will help you in awakening. Because the mind training of the Holy Spirit in Jesus is to let go of trying to write meaning onto a world that has no meaning. If you want to let something be written on this world, let the Holy Spirit do the writing. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can give you something really wonderful to write about this world. Namely that it's not there. It's an illusion. Be passers-by. The only value that this world holds is that you pass it by without looking for some hope in it. And that's also why I say when you want something from the world, the world will want something from you. As soon as you make a demand on this world, it seems like the dream characters show up, or, or the dream symbols, and it, they seem to be wanting something from you. They seem to be asking for something. But if you don't ask for anything from this world of images, the, I'll tell you the world of images will ask for nothing from you. You can rest truly rest in God. So let's see what happens here. We can see that John Murdoch is starting to get more empowered. Uh, he's starting to to let the Spirit use the power of his mind to rearrange time and space. In one sense he's like a miracle worker. He, If he needs a door or a place to escape, the door materializes. If, if he's angry, um, <laughs> that Dr. Schreiber uh, got tossed about 30, 30 or 40 feet um, just out of the anger arising. And then um, the doctor said, wow, you can do it. You can actually do it. And he said, what did I, what did I do? He was completely unaware it's just all still part of unconsciousness, but, but he's starting to be aware of the power of his mind. And that's the only purpose of A Course in Miracles, is to help you remember the power of mind. That, that you're not at the mercy of the world, because the ego belief, in conjunction with the power of the mind, made the projection. And and you cannot be at the mercy of a dream. Especially if you realize that you're dreaming it. If, if you forget that you're dreaming this dream, then it seems like you are at the mercy of forces that are outside of the mind. But that's not true. That's just a trick. And John Murdoch is starting to regain the, the awareness of the power of his mind. That he is actually not at the mercy of the world, he is not at the mercy of Dark City, and he's not even at the mercy of these attack thoughts, because he can remember his true power of divinity, and in that sense let go of investing in the belief in attack thoughts. That's what this movie is really showing us. That right now it's a dark world and, and John Murdoch is beginning to regain his remembrance of his own power in conjunction with God. And 
he will be in a position to have all of his memories reinterpreted. Even Dr. Schreiber, even the memories of meeting his wife, and every single experience, including with Uncle Carl, will all begin to be shown in a new light. But, in order to allow this reinterpretation, you first have to acknowledge that all the memories that you've had of your personal life, all of them, the good ones and the bad ones, are all lies. The good ones are shadows, the dark ones are, are dark shadows. The bad, the bad memories are dark shadows. But you can't let them go until you see them equally as, as all shadows. Jesus has a beautiful line in the Course where he says, The dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is present. So he's saying, your good dreams and your bad dreams, that's a trick. Because as long as you divide your dream up into good and bad, you still are not realizing the one thing that's important. And that's that you are the dreamer of the world of dreams. And no other cause does it have or ever will. You have to come to the acknowledgement of, of being the dreamer in order to escape the dream. The dreamer can dream a, a dream of non-judgment because the dreamer can join with the Holy Spirit. But the dream character cannot because the dream character is a projection. The human being is a projection of guilt. And you have to see another purpose for this world before you can let it go. And John is just getting closer. He still has a little bit of guilt around his relationship in particular. He, he is projecting his guilt still onto to Emma because he has this, still this sense that something went wrong in their relationship. From a worldly perspective, a worldly psychologist or psychiatrist would say, yeah, there is a problem there. Uh, she cheated. She had an affair, and that's a problem. That, that's what we call a marital problem, having an affair. And yet, what does Jesus tell us? Oh no, it's a perceptual problem. You've had a psychotic break from reality, the light, you're perceiving yourself now in a world of darkness. That's psychotic. And now you're schizophrenic too because you hear all these different voices and they're coming out of all these different bodies. And you hear these voices in your mind too. Like a committee of falsity, of separation. It's always arguing on what you should do or what you shouldn't do. Jesus says, this is, that's insane. You need to find the light. You need to hear only one voice, the Holy Spirit. And it's possible to hear only one voice without interrupting your regular activities in any, day, any way. You can still observe this world, but you can observe it when you're just tuned in to one voice. Not two. If you listen to Holy Spirit and ego, you're going to feel guilt. But if you listen only to Holy Spirit, only tune with the Holy Spirit. You learn to tune with the Holy Spirit and only with the Holy Spirit, then you become happy. Why? It's because you see you're not bound by the world anymore. You're the dreamer of the dream. You're not at the mercy of it. So John Murdoch is ready to show us, to demonstrate overcoming the world. Like Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now it's John's turn to show us the way. Okay, this is the human condition. Everyone's trying to make it back to Shell Beach. Everyone knows in their mind there's, a, there, there's something bright. There's something that's real. There's something that is true. 
But it's, it's so deep in the mind. And the mind is so accustomed to these memories and these images that it keeps looking for clues to find its way and it keeps looking into the images to find them. And Jesus is telling us, you won't find yourself in the images. You won't find yourself in history. You will not find yourself in time and space. You have to go inside. You have to go into the quiet to find it. And whether people look into family history books, genealogy, whether they try to find clues to their identity. Uh, we even have movies where a child is separated from parents and then the whole movie is about finding the parents, wherever they seem to be on, on planet Earth. But at this point of this movie, Dark City, John Murdoch is now coming to the end of his rope. He he keeps getting signs and symbols of Shell Beach. He asked the taxi driver, he asked his uncle Carl, he keeps asking, he even goes on the subway trains, the trains, how do you get to Shell Beach? Oh, that's the express. You want the express. But then he finds that it's part of the blue line and the express train never stops. <laughs> It never stops at the platform. <laughs> How tricky the ego is of making artificial ways to find God and then inducing the mind to try to follow these artificial ways. But you can't find it in time and space. That's the frustrating thing. That's why people sometimes get suicidal is because they've tried so many attempts to find their identity in the images. As the country song says, looking for love in too many faces, looking for love in all the wrong faces. Yeah, that, that country song is describing the predicament of the human race, looking outside for the answer to identity. And then Jesus tells us in the Course, Seek not outside yourself, for it will fail, and you will weep each time an idol falls. We've all been disappointed in our relationships, we've been disappointed in our friendships, we've been disappointed in our biological family, <laughs> we've been disappointed in our cultures, our societies, our governments. I mean, I meet people sometimes and they say, I, I'm tired. And I say, well, what are you tired of? Earth. <laughs> I'm tired of Earth. Get me a new planet. <laughs> they ask me, do you know how to astral project? I want to project onto <laughs> another planet. I'm tired of this one, actually. I want, to, I want the express. Tell me how to project to another planet. And I tell them, it's all the same. All the planets are the same. What? I want to get out of this dimension. I want to go to another dimension. I say, no, it's the same illusion. You need to forgive. Forgive all the dimensions. Forgive the belief in levels and the belief in other dimensions. They say, no, I want, I'm looking forward to going to the fifth dimension. I say, well, that was, a, that was a recording group in the 60s and the 70s, but the, the, you're not going to, there, there is no fifth dimension. How many dimensions are there to one reality? Is one difficult to understand? Do you, must you believe in many? <laughs> many dimensions, one reality. But can't I create my own reality? No. God is the creator of reality. You can only accept reality. You cannot create reality. That's right. Well, there goes a whole bunch more of spiritual pursuits I can let go of to teach me that I create my own reality. No. 
It's not true. That's not true either. And yet, here we have, we have John Murdoch, and he's gone to find his Uncle Carl, and his Uncle Carl said, you grew up in Shell Beach, meaning you, you're, it's closer to your origin, this Shell Beach. Brighter days, happy days. It's a memory in the mind of a forgiven world, of a happy dream. And that's what he's searching for. But you don't find it among the images. You find it in the perspective of the observer. You would find it in the, the quantum field. If we want to use a quantum physics analogy, that's where you find your forgiveness. But you don't find it in the specific objects. They're just projections. They're miscreations. They're distortions of, of love and light. They're dense, slowly vibrating projections. They have no reality whatsoever. So this is an important scene in the movie because I told you that the most important thing is to see the sameness of all the images. And John is about to realize that all of his memories, both good and bad, are all lies. And that is the key to forgiveness. Okay, you will not see, the next scene is the best Course in Miracles forgiveness scene in the history of the universe. So, if, if you don't understand what forgiveness is, you will by the end of this scene. Because if, if you think you need to forgive somebody for what they did to you, or forgive somebody because they didn't do what you think they should have done to you, Jesus says, now that's not forgiveness at all, that's false forgiveness. The true forgiveness is acknowledging in full awareness that what you think your brother or sister did to you has not occurred. It never happened. And that's because these are all false memory implants of the ego. So, in the case of John and Emma, it seems like Emma has committed adultery. That's, that's a violation of one of the Ten Commandments in the Bible. Seems pretty serious. No. Uh, you, you see that everything that was perceived in form was not done to you apart from your mind, but in fact it was a misperception of time. You have to believe in linear time before you can believe in grievances. You have to believe in linear time before you can see indiscretions, sins, uh, things that are clearly defined in society, in this world, as being wrong, are all part of a misperception of time. And that's what this scene is teaching. So enjoy it, because this scene is Jesus teaching us forgiveness in a very direct way. And we have a whole context of the whole movie to understand what, what it is. Enjoy it. <laughs> so, so we finally get a, a bigger perspective, and uh, it, the city looks like some kind of big, uh, kind of flat cylinder. So uh, you know how some people say the world is flat. <laughs> uh, but last week I showed you uh, down the rabbit hole, and we saw flatland, and it is very uh, two-dimensional in terms of the mind. It's just a projection of, of images. It's just like a flat projection, like a, like a screen, like a, a TV screen or a, a theater screen. And, and yet, um, the one thing that keeps the mind believing in the projection is guilt. Remember, we always come back to guilt. So, this next scene is again, um, he's on the verge of, of 
coming more into the power of the mind, but now the the projections have showed up and have his his perceived wife with a knife to her, and this again is reminds me of the the matrix scene when uh, Neo makes it all the way to the architect in the second matrix, and he comes to be told that the door to the right leads to the source and the door to the left leads back to Trinity and the Matrix and he doesn't even hesitate, he goes back for the door to the left it just shows you how how seductive the special love relationship is that scene with Neo in the Matrix was showing that he had a choice between the source the creator or Trinity in the Matrix, and he didn't even hesitate. He went back to save Trinity. And in this scene, um, he's just come to see that Shell Beach, he's pursued another image. He's blasted through that only to find the cosmos so that it's still the darkness of, the, of time and space. But he's had, we got a little glimpse of this uh, construct that uh, is being used by the the ego by the dark mind and it always still comes back to what is your greatest fear in this next scene his greatest fear is still losing his wife he still believes he has a real wife that he could lose so so when they hold a, a knife to her neck that is still the biggest threat he will then succumb to the sleep you know how the dark ones are always saying sleep sleep that's what how they protect their their false uh, uh, existence is through sleep. Everything is sleep, sleep, sleep. But we will see that he then is taken down into the subconscious mind. Isn't that wonderful? If if you knew that your subconscious mind was generating all of your trials and struggles and challenges, wouldn't you want to go there? Some of you remember the mate or the revolver movie. We came real close to showing revolver too. Where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. So again, this is a beautiful movie showing that he is taken down into the unconscious mind, down, down, down into the depth of the darkness. And yet, that's what Jesus is saying we are in for, we're going to go with Jesus on a journey into the subconscious mind only to see that we can pull our attention and our power of our mind away from the ego. That's the only reason to face the ego is to see that you're not the ego. That's the only reason to come look upon stark raving madness is to see that the stark raving madness is not real that it's not you. It never was you. You never could separate from God. You never could turn from the light. You never could make up a false identity, make up a false world. So these next scenes are very key because basically John succumbs to the fear of, of guilt and the fear of loss. He's taken down to the subconscious mind and finally gets to face his own belief. You either believe that the ego is real, you either believe in linear time or not. This is sounding a bit like Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. Shakespeare was giving us a course in miracles <laughs> back, back in the 1600s, early 1600s. So here we go. This is Succumbing one last time to fear of loss, dread of, of consequences, and, and basically the fear of the darkness to being taken down into the belly of the beast. Like in the island movie, you've got to go back and face the falsity right in the belly of the beast. Go right to the underbelly, and with the Holy Spirit's help, simply see the false is false. That's what this, these next scenes are really about. <laughs>
And now, I know you've hung in with me on the carpet for long enough. It's time to start getting a little Holy Spirit action coming in here now. Holy Spirit action. The syringe that the doctor said had all the answers. That is just the symbol of the Holy Spirit's reinterpretation of all the false memories. It's the Holy Spirit giving a new meaning to all the memories, seeing them all the same, equally false. <laughs> Make this year different by making it all the same. It's all in this syringe. And the doctor has been handed a syringe, the death syringe. The ego has said, imprint John Murdoch with, with these memories. It's saying, give John our memories. Well, we know what the ego's memories are. We know what the ego's intention. What were they all chanting there? Kill him. It's a death wish. What do you get from a death syringe except the wish to not be who you are? To be forever separate from God. And that's of course the ego's belief that, that it, it has accomplished the impossible. It has, it has pulled off the separation and, and now God is not God anymore. God is helpless and powerless because the ego believes it's pulled off the great grand separation. But the syringe is the Holy Spirit's reinterpretation of every memory that, that was generated by the ego from one of linear time into a simultaneous correction of love and light. And this is what brings the mind back into the full realization of its power that the mind is not at the mercy of the ego, but the mind was created by God in love and light and cannot lose its creative power. What God wills is forever. So the belief that you can be a creature of time and space is, is, is just a puff of nothingness. And this syringe is a beautiful example of here the doctor who's supposed to be the expert in knowing the ways of the human mind is now giving himself over to the Holy Spirit. So instead of using the death syringe, the poisonous syringe of, of death, he uh, remembers that John took his syringe, the one that had all the answers in and that remember he tucked it away I'll keep it so now the doctor gets turned around to be used by the Holy Spirit and at last the Holy Spirit and the light and the reinterpretive power of the light are coming to bear in this dark movie <laughs> I know you've been waiting for this like <laughs> when when do we see the light in this backwards and upside down dark world of denial and repression? When do we see the light? Well, here we go. Finally, the helpful syringe. This is, this is what, what do we call it? The pandemia of COVID. COVID is just about ready to meet its match with the vaccination of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> now I know some of you are saying is this what forgiveness looks like? <laughs> but let's, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit's interpretation of this. If you've believed in error if you believed in separation if you were so sure that you could make yourself different than God created you then what looks like a battle isn't really a battle. It's simply the withdrawing of your mind's power from a belief. You made the ego by believing in it and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. But as you withdraw your belief from the ego, it's not a good loser. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a death wish. Did you expect it to just roll over and go, uh, okay, <laughs> oops. <laughs> no, 
This is a death wish, and until you withdraw your mind entirely from the death wish, with whatever you still offer to the ego, whatever you still believe in it ever so slightly, it's going to use the power of your mind to make it into a battle. But in the end, what did Jesus teach us? In my defenselessness, my safety lies. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. He said, if somebody smites you on one cheek, what did he say? Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Resist not evil. The way you transcend the ego is through your defenselessness. It's pulling your mind away from this belief. And that's why you, don't, you can't judge this world as good or bad or right or wrong. It, it was never there. It was never outside. It was just a belief in the mind. And all you have to do is look at it with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. That's all. It's very calm actually, but, but this scene seems to be a very dark battle in the unconscious mind. If you were talking to a Christian, a, a, a Christian might tell you, that's a battle for your soul. <laughs> that's a battle for your soul. Are you either, as God created you, or are you a product of the devil? Uh, and basically, it, there is no battle. It's just that when you withdraw all faith in the ego, you remember the light. You remember the light. There's no battle to be fought. In fact, the ego enjoys a battle because it always wants to preserve itself and preserve the belief in attack. And all battles have attack. So, in this final set of scenes in the movie, you're going to see John and uh, I think it's Mr. Book, <laughs> Mr. Book with all this telepathic power. It's just a representation of John still believing in the ego. But in the end, it has to be that you overcome uh, the ego by simply withdrawing all belief from it. And that's where the total reinterpretation of the dream comes. You can have a total reinterpretation. The ego is, Jesus tells us, upside down. The world you, you believe in is upside down and backwards. And so imagine what the world would be if it was right side up. Imagine the world where it's turned toward the light instead of kept in darkness. Imagine a world bathed in light. That's our happy dream. There comes our Shell Beach. And he has kept the faith that there is an actual Shell Beach. And there is a, a forgiven state of mind, a happy dream. And he's just got to pull his mind's energy away and tune into the light to be free. And, and that is everyone's journey. That's, uh, he's our, he's our way shower today. Jesus is using John Murdoch <laughs> to show us the way. Okay, here we go. Hold, stay on the carpet though. Don't leave the carpet. Enjoy the, enjoy these scenes from the carpet. Ha ha ha! Here it is. The dagger is, is an attack thought. Now, are you going to believe in attack or not? That is really the question. <laughs> to be or not to be. There comes the dagger. You either accept that into your mind or you do the Neo <laughs> with the bullets. You have got to resist, release, let go of the belief in attack. Because as long as you believe in attack, you'll believe in mistreatment. You'll believe in victimization. You'll believe in wrongdoing. You believe that there's something outside of yourself that's gone wrong. 
And it's just resisting the dagger, is resisting the belief in attack. So all it is is, this is a scene of for once and for all, no. No, no, no. No to the knife. No to the blade. No to the belief in attack. So he's ready for Shell Beach now. He's ready for that happy dream. But I just want to remind you what that is. The, the happy dream is the dream that given back to the Holy Spirit. So there's no memory of the past intruded on this dream. That means when you meet your brother, you meet your sister, you literally meet them for the first time as if you've never known them before. Because in the happy dream there is no stain of the past. All of your lovely thoughts and your loving thoughts have been saved for you. And Jesus describes this in A Course in Miracles as a purified form of the past. How lovely! A purified form of the past. It must be that the symbols have been let go of in terms of linear time and you meet your beloved, which is yourself, for the very first time. Free, clear, clean, untarnished, fresh, brand new. You meet yourself in the present moment. And you simply see your brother and your sister without any judgments of the past. You don't see that they're farther along or that they're behind. You don't see that they're superior or inferior. This is the Holy Spirit's reinterpretation of the special relationship. So John is about to step through into the happy dream. And he still has a love for Anna, or Emma, actually. And uh, he's been told by the doctor, she's, she's no longer Emma, she's Anna. But it won't matter <laughs> in the happy dream, because the sameness is felt. You, you are seeing your brother and your sister for the very first time, with no memory of the past. Because the ego is the past. And to see your brother and sister without any judgment is to see with the Holy Spirit. And that's how we wake up to the Christ. That's how we wake up to eternity and reality. Is we hold nothing against anyone based on the past. Whatever they seem to do, positive or negative, it's not true. Whatever their actions were, you aren't going to hold some false past interpretation against your beloved because that would be holding it against yourself. And remember, God creates eternally. The ego made up all these time memories to try to keep the mind guilty. So here we go. John is ready to go into a new book of dreams. Not an evil book of dreams, but a a cleansed. You notice the water is all around the construct. The water is just shooting out. The, the, the dark ones, the attack thoughts, were always afraid of moisture now. <laughs> He's generated a whole ocean <laughs> around this construct. The ocean is still a, a projection, but you see how it's, a, it's part of a healed proje projection. It, it's actually, there's no projection. It's actually just seeing everything is your mind and there's nothing outside of your mind. But in terms of form, this is the way the Holy Spirit reinterprets. So we still have what seems to be Emma or Anna and we, we see John. Wasn't that the, the last word from, uh, from Nemo and Mr. Nobody? Anna. <laughs> this is Anna's first time to see the movie. Here we go! Show us Anna! for the first time. If we didn't get it with Mr. Nobody, we've got another chance with Dark City. 
for to really see Anna without any judgment. Okay, we can cut it right there. <laughs> yes, we. You made it. <laughs> you stepped off the carpet finally. The carpet ride. <laughs> So, well, that's beautiful. That, that really gives us a context for spiritual awakening. And I think that movie helps reinforce some of the, the deep metaphysics of A Course in Miracles. And really, that's what Jesus wants. He wants you to go into that workbook with a, a bit of a foundation so that your mind is not too shocked or too resistant to the transfer of training in the workbook. So I often feel that uh, sometimes watching a movie like this can collapse the time that you need to spend on the text. Because uh, it's, it's kind of like a symphony. He just picks up a topic, sets it down, picks it up, sets it down, and he kind of does the roto rooter on the on the ego uh, during the text, uh, preparing it for the workbook. But once you anchor in some of these uh, deep metaphysics with the the graphics, visual graphics provided by the movie, I think it can save you thousands of years. And, and make your mind much more uh, open and ready, uh, ripe for, for the, the uh, turning your mind from upside down to right side up. Turning your mind from hiding and distracting with images to being very receptive to guidance and nudges and prompts. Because following the guidance is so essential. Um, without following the guidance and really having these miraculous experiences, then then the course would could just seem to become something like a, a an intellectual uh, task or some kind of distractive self concept uh, where personhood is still maintained. So. I enjoyed hearing about all of your emotions from the facilitators and it seems like we covered the gamut from falling asleep to miracles. <laughs> so, and that's pretty much our, our experience as human beings. We can go from, from such resistance, Jesus even talks about this in the workbook where he says if you feel your mind slipping off into enervation, um, into fatigue or resistance, then just relax, be gentle. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning of the movie. Like if it, if it gets to be too overwhelming or too intense, turn the sound off or, or step away. Uh, and, and don't feel guilty for that either. Feel like, well, I think I've got a full, full plate here. And, and then the ones who experienced a lot of emotions coming up, like fear or a feeling of being trapped in a closed system or uh, kind of frustrated, like suffocated by the, the game of time and space, um, even that is, is helpful just to get in touch with that because it, it doesn't feel good and, and there's something inside you that knows there has to be more than that feeling of, of entrapment. And um, for some of you, the metaphysics of this movie are so clear that, you know, you can find the ego rear up and saying, you know, that's, that's too bland or boring where this is heading. If this is heading to the light, I want excitement. <laughs> and and definitely uh, this world generates a lot of excitement, although it also can generate a lot of stress and uh, a lot of uh, fear and guilt. 
And what we're wanting to do is free our minds from that fear and guilt and being able to really rest in, in, in peace. I don't mean that in terms of like going to the grave, <laughs> rest in peace, but I mean really rest in God, rest in, in God's love and light. So this is our opportunity to really open it up. And um, Pete can keep an eye if you want to raise, wave your hand or raise your digital hand. Um, feel free to share whatever is on your heart. Okay, so uh, I'll open it up for first uh, Jan. You can unmute there. Hello? Hi, is it, is it Jan or Jan? How do we pronounce your name? Yeah, I, I'm Jan from Holland. I, Jan, I, of course. I, I had contact with you sometimes. Yes, yes. You knocked me off my feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I, I still feel in a kind of shock. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's how, now you know how the saints and mystics felt. St. John of the Cross, uh, he's just uh, at his church and praying and devoting his mind to God, and then all of a sudden, dark night of the soul uh, time hits. But, yeah, that's what this movie shows us. Yeah. I know this feeling um, now and then, in the dark places, and I know I have to go there. I hope I can translate in English. Um, and when I, whenever I can sleep or something, I try to go deeper and deeper into that feeling to release it. Um, but uh, and and I feel I feel stuff releasing, but. Uh, every time, every time I think, "Oh my God, it's just much more." <laughs> and when I see this movie, I think, "Oh, this is really hell." Um, and then again, it's all made up, <laughs> but it feels so. Yeah. Um, and all the time, the struggle uh, I feel and. Um, and yeah, sorry to say it, but uh, I still ha have uh, problems to feel the love of God. Sometimes I feel uh, I feel peace. I feel more and more peace, but the love of God is still strange. To to be honest. And there's a very strong longing for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think when I hear that too, I and I know of our conversations and our uh, interactions, um, what comes to me is that when I came to the Course, Jesus was saying, you know, you need to prepare yourself for the love of God, like it would be too traumatic um, to have a direct approach. That's why it's called A Course in Miracles. And then he reminded me that miracles were a collaborative venture. I like that, uh, when Jesus uses words like collaborative venture, because I could relate to that. Like, for example, I think you have, is it art? Lots of art pours through you. You like channel art. and. Recently, I have a, a friend in Brazil who's originally from Chile, and uh, his name is Enrique. And um, we talked, uh, we chatted a bit maybe 15 years ago, and then he, he contacted me recently, and he's a prolific artist like yourself. He's, I mean, his focus, his venue, and mainly is in paintings, but he's kind of like a a prolific kind of Vincent van Gogh, brilliant colors and uh, amazing paintings. Um, I asked him how many paintings he'd done, and he said, well, he's been painting for decades, and he would do uh, like a painting sometimes every day. 
And I said, how many paintings? And he said, well, I don't know, 65,000 or something uh, of these spectacular paintings. Imagine Van Gogh with all the colors and the, you know, knock your, knock your socks off with those paintings. And then, so he contacted me uh, now during the pandemic and COVID, and he's just like, yeah, David, I, I'm feeling to collaborate. I, I really want to collaborate with you. Now this this excites me because to me this is where the practical application of the miracle comes in. When we can join together in some kind of collaboration where our skills and abilities can be unified in a way that sends out a blessing to all of our brothers and sisters, to me that's practical. That's very practical. So you know, we have centers in uh, in the United States and Mexico and, and Europe. And I have kind of a, a, a thing called base camp where I communicate that way. But anyway, I just put out the idea. I said, hey, Enrique and I want to collaborate on this uh, art project. He was thinking maybe use a painting with a workbook lesson from the course or maybe a quote from one of my books, uh, or something. And then we got a, a big call going after some emails and some messaging, and then we probably have maybe like 10 people on the, on the team now, and all kinds of new ideas are coming, even about parables or, um, you know, mixing in music, doing a music video with the art, or, uh, sharing quotes, but but all kinds of ideas started to flow from this team of maybe 10, 12 people. And to me, this is where you start to open your heart to love, is where you just take your skills and abilities and you offer them up to the Holy Spirit and say, what would you have me do? How, how can I be most helpful? And the first call that we had, I swear, we were laughing, we were all laughing so hard, even with his technical issues, his grandson was there behind him, peeping his head around and went to get help. And we, even with the technical issues, we laughed our way through it. And then we just have such a joyful time. And I find that that is, that's the practical applications of this. Um, it's through the collaborative venture where we just say, I want to be helpful, and I just want to be open to be shown uh, what that could be. I want to surrender over into that. Here, we have to unmute mute you again. We, have, we can't hear you. There you go. Let's see if we can unmute you. Uh, I, I was, um, you read my mind? Because I was just thinking about it. I made a whole lot of art. I, sh I showed you something um, inspired by the course. And to tell you the truth, when every now and then I made something and then I, I really feel free when it's coming from the heart and the space and even titles come into the pictures afterwards and it's, wow, this is... This is what this is what I want. This is what I'm here. Yeah. So I like to share it. We talk about it later. I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you could, you, if you could use it in any way, feel free. It is for free. You can use it. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for your generosity, and that's our prayer. Is always what what will send a blessing whether it's uh, through art or music or movies or, or anything, uh, dance, let it, let it be a blessing. Yeah, I think so. This, this is really my, I know I, I know this is my purpose why I'm here. So I like to share it. That's, it's, um, the problem is not everybody can tune into what I'm doing. 
And that is also my frustration. Mm. People who are in the course, not only in the course, but they tune in to the, they get the vibe from the art. Uh, hard to explain, but <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah, but when I was in in Holland uh, in 2019 for the Into the Kingdom uh, retreat, I met a couple uh, who I think the husband was this amazing engineer and designer. And, um, you know, with Holland, with the, the issues around water and water management and water levels and everything is very big, he was channeling the Holy Spirit and getting all kinds of designs and things that would just bless the whole country. Uh, and he shared a bit of it when I had a chance to talk with him. He was getting downloads um, of, of designs to, to help the country out that way. And, and I have another friend who uh, is from Utah and he designed, he's the inventor of Dolby, uh, Dolby Stereo. And um, he recently uh, developed some different symptoms and conditions um, where he, he couldn't really control uh, his movements uh, and he started to have extreme conditions. And he went into such deep prayer that uh, the Spirit designed through him a, a, a sound healing machine that where you put the earphones on, and he received it. He always receives these mental images, and that's how he, he invented Dolby, was through these schematics that he received. And with this, he received an entire uh, healing mechanism, and it, it was so effective that he listened to his own, his own machine and put the headphones on and completely cleared away uh, all the symptoms. He couldn't even go out of his house. But it was kind of a, a beautiful example of physician heal thyself. Like really give yourself over to the divinity within yourself that has all goodness and, and all blessings. And so now I'm down in Mexico and a friend of mine, she's got the machine. She flew back and brought a, a, a machine down so she's ran a retreat recently and she had people putting on the headsets and it's way beyond hemisync. It's like, it's highly advanced and I think it works with just about anything, but it's, it's again, it's a way of coming back into attunement, which is perfect for this movie. You know, learning how to tune. <laughs> that, that even has the, the, the sound component. Tune, tune with it. So thank you, Jan. Yeah, we'll, We'll always stay open to that because um, your art is amazing. And then actually uh, when I was over in Mallorca and I first started the center over there, I started getting flashes of, of music studios when I was walking through the casitas and I was seeing something extremely musical happening there in this house. And now uh, we had a concert uh, this morning uh, for us, 7 a.m. here, but in the afternoon for you in Europe. But it was uh, a lot of the a lot of the concert came from this uh, house that we have over there in uh, in Spain, in, on the island of Mallorca. So it seems to unfold. All we have to do is follow these deep inspirations and remember that it's a collaborative venture. We're not alone. We don't have to figure anything out on our own. We just have to relax and, and enjoy the, the collaborations. Also, uh, yeah, I got a beautiful message from, uh, through Diana Deneb about, from my, my friends uh, Aden and Laura down in Brazil about wanting to collaborate with us uh, in some way, uh, very deep way with co-living. So we'll take that into prayer too, but um, Anybody who has a, a strong feeling about collaboration or some beautiful, strong ideas coming, please uh, share them with us. I, I know some of you I see on the gallery too here, like Sundara, you know, we've 
Sundari has, has been a big collaborator with me for, for years and years at her house, and uh, you're living up to your namesake today, uh, Sundari, with the, the sunshine symbols and sunflowers and miracles happening. So that's what it's all about, is just really immersing together in the, the joinings and the collaborations. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well we do have quite a few hands up, so I just ask that everybody just keep to the heart of what they want to share so we can hear from as many as possible. And uh, next um, we can go with Thomas, you can unmute there. Okay. Hi Thomas. Awesome. <laughs> hey y'all. Awesome, Dave. Thank you so much. And uh, so, uh, great movie today. And uh, I am very, very inspired and have benefited greatly from, um, you know, your programs and your early interviews going way back to 2000, like 10 and 11 and such. And uh, so, I got into the course. And thank you for today and everything. It's been great. Movie was very uh, metaphorical about, you know, <laughs> my life for sure. So I, I got into the course early on, um, and I have no religious, you know, upbringing, you know, uh, I just was free to explore, and I knew there was another way of looking at things early on. And so I got into the course early, and I just tore into it, couldn't put it down, and then I dropped it, and uh, there was an issue back then, and there was an issue that's come back as I've recently found the course again, and I'm powering through it and made it making a commitment to, for change and peace and finding that that deep center however there's an issue um that i don't know maybe give me some input my, my question is like in three parts here so is it necessary for me to have an understanding of god and what god is um can't wrap my arms around it don't know that or even about spirit you know, moving in life, you know, I hear you guys on, you know, your sessions and talking about, you know, how, you know, if you turn it over and you give it over and, you know, give your life over and applying these concepts and watching how things, you know, the spirit moves in your life. And, you know, I hear Francis talk and I'm, I'm in awe, like, because I don't sense it. And, and at the same time, I'm like, well, how is it that spirit and God is involved in these people's lives, but yet, you know, God knows nothing of this world. So it, it seems, uh, you know, so I'm having trouble. So that leads me then to the next part of this ratcheting down from the bigger <laughs> picture, which is the most important to the guidance is, and, and believe me, I've listened to your sessions about guidance and, um, uh, Making it obvious. That's what I wake up in the morning with. I go on my walks, you know, make it obvious. Show me something. I mean, you know, when I was younger, first getting in the course, it was very difficult. And, and yet again, so I, I, so then that leads me to, you know, I don't understand prayer or what that is and how to apply it. Must I do that? Um, so the guidance has led me into, you know, I'm, I'm keep, I have no desire for anything in the world and, and I'd love to be free of concepts. And yet I've struggled with, you know, professional life and making money. And because of that, a spurned fear of what am I going to do tomorrow? And I was listening to you the other day talking about give no, or today you're talking about give no thought for tomorrow, like what Jesus said. So I'm like, God. That would be awesome. <laughs> so you see all this is kind of tied together. And then, you know, you said today about the movie, well, you gotta, you've got to examine the self-hatred. And I don't really have a self-hatred concept, but maybe, I know, maybe there's, I feel guilt about not being able to be consistently making money and supporting my family and such. So th these items are all kind of tied together here. And I'd, I'd love to have a breakthrough. I'd love to be able to express the joy of my heart, 
like I hear you guys are doing instead of me grinding through and, and having to, you know, maybe I take it too seriously what's going on in the world. And I, I'd love to f- try to figure out a way to surrender and listen and, and, and express that and, and not be, and not have to, you know, think about the money or this or that. And I, I'd love to find, you know, how to tune into God and spirit becoming more evident in my life. So yeah. thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hope that wasn't too much. No, no, so. that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. Well, yeah, since you've tuned in to uh, me and you hear Francis and everything, when Francis encountered A Course in Miracles, it was very much like when you encountered A Course in Miracles, Thomas, that it basically she came into it with no prior uh, learning or understanding about uh, Christianity or God. She basically was raised in a very atheistic family that basically had the belief system, if you can't perceive it and you can't see it, then it doesn't exist. Um, You know, very much of a life based on whatever the five senses are showing and nothing more. And so when Francis first encountered the Course, she, like you, had a had an inkling of there has to be more, there has to be like another way of living, another way of looking at the world. But she didn't have any kind of idea of prayer, of God, of miracles, of, of a spiritual journey. Uh, she was... She was a businesswoman. Uh, she, like myself, had many, many years of, of education, university education. But she had no prior inclination whatsoever to, to spirituality. And um, whereas I came from a Christian background, that's a little bit of context, but not with Francis. And so when I first met Francis, um, she had heard me giving a, a talk in uh, Sydney, and then she was curious. But she had a very large uh, Course in Miracles meetup group in Sydney, and she was teaching the course, um, reading it and teaching it. But by her own definition, she was teaching it very conceptually. Um, she was just doing her best to read the book and then share with students or with people that would show up in her her group uh, come to her house and at that point she it was kind of a pretty controlled uh, experience but there was no sense of prayer there was no sense of guidance there was no sense of being moved in a huge way you know like a like a, a carol King song, I feel the earth move under my feet, I feel the sky tumbling down. No, Francis had no sky tumbling down and no earth moving. It, was, it wasn't registering. Um, it was just, she was just going through it conceptually. And then um, I invited her, to, she was invited to come up to a week-long retreat up in Noosa, to the nor- in the northern part uh, north of Brisbane and we did such an experiential week that Francis said her heart just like exploded it, it's, it's like it blew out of its shell it, it, it was such a mind blowing experience and I don't know there's probably 40-50 people there but we did all the things we do expression sessions and all kinds of experiential exercises and it was it was huge for a lot of people, but for Francis, it. She told me she said, I, "My life will never be the same. I don't I don't even know what's next. I don't know what what's coming, but I know I'm not the same as I was when I went up there." At first, she was even hesitant to spend a week out of her life um, to go up to a retreat. But then, when she came out of it, she thought, "Oh my God." This is absolutely uh, mind-blowing. Then I do remember talking with her and, and saying, uh, 
well, I could come down and, and uh, Jason and I can, we could come to your house and visit you. And I do remember coming into her house. It was a nice big house in Sydney and uh, talking with her, chatting with her, so forth. And then she just basically said, uh, I need to go out and get some groceries. Jason, you come with me. So they went to the grocery store, and then little Frances kind of cornered Jason in the grocery store. And she looked him in the eye and she said, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for me to have an you know, a full-blown experience with this? And uh, Jason said something to the effect of, well, David says, it's a lifelong devotion. <laughs> so in one sense, it was kind of like a calling moment. But Frances didn't stop there, you know, she wouldn't stop. She said, no, I mean, give it to me straight. What's it going to take? Really, I really want to know. I mean, I'm not leaving the grocery store. <laughs> you tell me, what's it going to take? And Jason just said, it's going to take trust. And she said, what do you mean, trust? Trust who? And Jason said very confidently, Trust me and trust David. <laughs> That's, that was this, you see, very practical answer, kind of a starting point. And, and that started a very deep joining where sometime later I went down to a, a retreat in Kangaroo Valley and um, it was like for 10, 12 days or something like that. And at one point again, Frances had all these questions in her mind, but she came to me to do a one-on-one. -on -one. And I was just answering her questions. She had many questions. And I remember talking to her, and I, I could see as I was answering her questions, she, her eyes were getting a little bigger and bigger. And then finally, later on, she told me, David, you were talking, but suddenly this voice started in my own mind. And it was basically saying to her, David is the representation of me. Uh, you have to really... Give yourself over to that. While I was, while David character was talking, this voice in her mind was very clearly telling her, giving her instructions. And she's had that happen a number of times where it's like once she cracked open, then, then the instructions seem to start. Um, not that they would be continuous, but here and there she would just hear a very clear instruction that was very important. And that's pretty much how it went for the original four with the course. Uh, Helen, um, Judy, Bill, and Ken, uh, they would occasionally get very strong directions and messages. And then they would follow. They, and that's what Frances did. She just as soon as she got her crack open experience, then she really followed. She was very sincere. It didn't matter that she didn't have any training in religion or training in spirituality. She, her education had nothing to do with spirituality. And her, her background with her family had absolutely nothing to do with spirituality. But she was sincere. She had a very, very sincere heart. And now that's why... You can see her laughing and talking about how happy she is and God is everything. And even after our opening session Friday night when we were going back before she went off to her casita, she just, she, she just said three words to me. I am happy. I am happy. That was it. You know, that was, that was the full expression right there. And then off she went into her casita. So I think... That is a good answer to your question that um, I, I think you, you shouldn't put any kind of pressure or stress on yourself at all, but, but there will be opportunities that will show themselves. And when they do show themselves, all you have to do is jump in. And then the Spirit's got you, almost like a water slide, that once you're on that water slide, <laughs> you're, you're going down for the splash, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a done deal. But 
Frances also would tell you she had to be very patient because sometimes she would get a, a very strong instruction and then she would have to wait for some time before it would become evident. Um, and it's not about rote repetition, you know, like saying, make it obvious every day. That's beautiful. If, it, if you can feel that's an expression of your heart, that's a beautiful prayer. But also don't be hard on yourself because um, it does take a bit of patience to, uh, to stay on the ready. And then when the opportunity comes, just to, to go for it, you know, to, to make the leap. So thank you, Thomas. I'm sure your question was for many, many, many people. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, we can go to uh, Lucy next. Yeah. Hola, David. Hi, David. I am here in Mexico. I started the course at the beginning of this year. And the same, I have a lot of questions, but I know that it's normal because it's little by little with the time and the practice. But I would like to, if you could please give me advice on how can I dominate the ego, no, not judging, how can I get out of of a talk when you, there's a lot of people judging or how can I react or comment? What can I do? Okay, well Lucy, the first thing that is coming to mind is, is to talk a little bit about faith. Um, faith is, is not a matter of degree, uh, it's, it's, it's not a matter of, um, of less and more, it's what Jesus says, you either give your mind over to faith or to faithlessness. So it emphasizes the power of the mind and that every moment we are choosing whether to put our faith in the spirit or in the ego. So everyone has faith, but it's like, how am I investing my faith? So your question is very much like in the Bible where Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Uh, he was describing dominion over the ego through his faith and devotion to follow just the Holy Spirit. And in your example, if, if you have people that seem to be surrounding you, that seem to be judging, um, that's where your faith, the strength of your faith comes in to not try to take a side, to not have to defend or explain, to not have to correct or change anyone. So when you're surrounded by a group of people and they seem to be judging, that is your opportunity to stay in the faith of the miracle, to realize that your purpose is to see the whole situation as a whole. Not to pick out any people or anything that you think should be different, but more a presence of acceptance. Because as part of being a human being, part of our conditioning is, is a, we're trained in education to judge. Uh, we're trained by our parents uh, to judge. We're trained by our schools to judge. Uh, even if we come to a place and there's an issue, uh, sometimes people say, what's your, what's your stance? Uh, what's your opinion 
on the issue. And when I traveled, I traveled to 44 countries, I got a lot of opportunities in airplanes, airports, <laughs> buses, trains. I was always around people. Not that I always spoke their language, but, <laughs> but I always had people around me. And most of the practice was, was just to be very still and, and inward and, and practice not having to judge or, or, dis, or fix anything or figure anything out. A lot of my practice came when I, I went to South America. I, I would have large groups of people around me that were always speaking Spanish. And I had never a clue what, what they were saying. But I could just feel the presence inside me say, it's, it's all good. It's, just relax and be happy. Uh, that your, your happiness is the, is the teaching. It's not, uh, it's not even in the words. And, and I had to start to really relax to not be concerned about understanding because our conditioning is that we understand through the words. And Jesus says, no, it's through the practice of the Course, the principles, that we finally break through and come to peace of mind. And finally we understand when we reach peace. But, but we have to have a lot, a lot of faith to be shown. And, and in one sense we have to step back. We have to step back in our mind from a leadership position to, Lord, show me. <laughs> show me, show me what, what I'm to do here. Show me if there's anything for me to say. Put the words in my mouth if there's anything I need to speak. You know, that, that was a big step for me because I was used to speaking autonomously. And Jesus would say, don't keep, just quit wasting words. Wait, I'll speak through you if there's anything at all to say. <laughs> and so I had to kind of really step back, you know, and be humble uh, and, and let truth go before me. So I think that's the biggest thing to remember, is if you can just ad adopt a very humble uh, state of mind of listen and follow, Lord show me the way, uh, direct my footsteps, direct my words, then things happen much faster because we're, we're so open, we're so willing in that state of mind. And that's the fastest way to have dominion over the ego. Yeah. <laughs> okay, beautiful. <laughs> okay. Well, next we can go to uh, Louise, if you'd like to unmute there. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Hi, David. I have a question, but before I, I, I want to say that this movie was an hour, horrible for me. So much anxiety, so much fear. And I told myself, okay, go until the end. That, that's what I did. I was not supposed to talk about this, but you just said a few minutes a few few minutes ago ask 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 Jesus or spirit to give you the words and it's like this it, it seemed that the, the words are coming because I didn't want to to talk about that but I will <laughs> okay I want I want to say that um, maybe I'm not alone. I'm sure, but uh, it's hard to say in front of people that I want to to, to psychiat psychiatry psychiatry for a few years ago. But 
from this period, uh, it, um, I have a lot of um, fear around the, I told, uh, I, I said it to you before, around the unreality. And um, in this movie was showing the, the ego, the unreality of the ego, but I saw it if it was so real. And I felt a lot of anxiety. And um, sometimes I, and, and when you talk about the dark night of the soul, it, it's, it, it's, my life is, it's very like that, you know. Yeah. And I keep going and I ask for help with people, Marga and others. And I talk to you always, even if it's very hard. <sighs> but I'm, I, well, I think I just want to to know to know that I am on the right path, even if it's so so dark and painful. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, I think when Frances talked on Friday, she talked about how when she first came to the monastery and she was, she really was uh, very keen to really move, move forward. Uh, but at the time, JP said, well, just, just relax and, and, and feel into what, what feels most helpful. Um, like, for example, years ago, Norman Cousins was uh, given a terminal illness diagnosis, and his reaction was to watch comedy movies for a whole year. <laughs> That's what his reaction was to a terminal illness diagnosis. Um, so I was mentioning earlier, I said, well, if I had even more time today, I, I actually had some clips uh, from John Cleese, who was part of Monty Python, uh, talking about the need to really look at, at what was, was feared, but in such a light way, uh, and also yet a very uh, important way. And so you're aware of that. You you are already aware of of the of the need to look at at what has been hidden, but I would do it in the most joyful way possible. Um, like for example, sometimes people go into our movie watchers' guide to enlightenment, and they can go through the sections, and they may be drawn to particular themes, or they might be drawn into the humor. Uh, but they intuitively know the way uh, to do it, you know, because there's a gentleness with that intuition. It's like, it's not, a, it doesn't have a push to it, it's soft. And I think that's very important for you, is to be very soft in this, and to realize that there's no rush, you know, you're not, nobody's judging you or judging your progress, uh, it's most important for you to be gentle and soft. Uh, I have one friend who, last year he contacted me from India, and he had been a part of, a member of Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment for three years, but, but he was so busy that once he found himself uh, in Mumbai, that he decided he would go through the, the movie's alphabetical order. <laughs> so he, he told me he started with A, and just that was what he was guided to do, alphabetical order. But it had to be the perfect time. He was too busy before that, and then when it dawned on him, oh yeah, the, why am I looking on Netflix to try to find a movie when I have a subscription I... I can just go intuitively. And he did. And uh, it helped him so much because his teacher had died and he, he went through a lot of intensity uh, after his teacher died. So I think 
That's the main thing I would say to you, Louise, is, you know, you're so loved and you're so supported. And, and all you have to do is take it slow and easy and, and really just be soft. Because that's the most important thing for you. That's the way that you'll, you'll slowly build a confidence and that anxiety will start to fall away. You know, as you get into this gentle rhythm of, of just take what you can take every day in a soft way. You don't even have to push with anything at all. Just be very, very, very soft. And we love you so much. We're, we're with you and, and you've got mighty companions like with Marga that, that adore you and are, are just ready to hold your hand and take you Walk very slowly, step by step. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, David. Well, we have uh, just about 14 minutes or a bit under. Would you like another question? Yeah, let's keep on rolling here. Okay. Let's go to uh, <laughs> Sangeeta. You can unmute there. Unmute? Yes, Hi, David. You're good. Hi, Sangeeta. Hi. Hi, David. Thank you for your commentary. That was brilliant. Really, really fantastic. Um, I came off the magic carpet because somebody came into the room. And so I'm a bit upset because I feel like I might have sabotaged my process in like so facing the self-hatred. So I wondered if you could like, I was just really, because the discon it disconnected maybe five, ten minutes of the end of the movie. And so, would you be able to tell me, is it going to sabotage my process? Or have I sabotaged it? Yeah, I think that that can come up from time to time where where we step away from our focus or our reminder. But I know for myself, when I would have those kind of things happen, um, I would, Jesus would always come back to me with, well... Now just stop for a moment and, and reset and try again. Um, or he would even uh, have me turn on the radio. I remember one time uh, many years ago, maybe it was in, in, even in the 1980s, I remember uh, I, feel, I felt like I had gotten off track. And... Uh, and I remember Jesus guided me to this Billy Joel song uh, called The Stranger. And the line that helped me from The Stranger was, don't be afraid to try again. Everyone goes sour every now and then. You've done it. Why can't someone else? You should know by now. You've been there yourself. Uh, that helped just the first line, don't be afraid to try again, everyone goes sour every now and then. It was like a permission thing, like, like spirit knows we're going to, to seem to fall off the beam, we're going to seem to sabotage, we're going to miss the mark from time to time. And there's a part of us, the ego is very perfectionistic, you know, it, it's like looking for every scrap, every little thing that we seem to do wrong. It's kind of keeping a notebook, and it's like making a mark every single time there is a, a, an error or a sabotage attempt. So that's part of our practice of learning to be gentle with ourselves, and then as we, as we get better at that, then we also can extend the gift to our brothers and sisters. But we always seem to have to start with ourself. You know, we really, it starts there. And then gradually as we get better and more relaxed and more forgiving, really, then uh, we can start to extend the gift. So, yeah, thank you. Even to go through a whole movie and, and then just at the last 10 minutes the ego tried to tried to trip you up. But then you can say, well, oh, there's an oops. 
you know, sometimes I would use that word, oops, uh, because it, it seems lo- lighter. <laughs> there, that was an oops. I remember one time I, I had a, a listened to a singer uh, who made a song about that. And the way the song goes, it, it, it's like, oops, I made a mistake. You're beautiful, beautiful. Oops, I made a mistake. You're beautiful to me. You see, it, it, it has that softness that acceptance in the beautifulness, you know, that, that we're, we, we don't need to hold ourselves against anything. And we, we, little by little, we start to feel that beauty, like we really are beautiful. And it's beautiful on the screen, because right where your head is, there's this beautiful bouquet of flowers right behind you, and it's, it's like a crown of, like a queen's crown. <laughs> so... It's beautiful. We've got light and flowers above you. <laughs> so, thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you. Mm. Okay, well, next we can go to Ruth. You can unmute. Hola. <laughs> Hola, Ruth. <laughs> Hi. Hi, uh, so cool to talk to you. Yes, the translation is working. Yeah, yes, yes. If, well, I'm very happy. I just wanted to give you thanks. Um, today has been a um, day of a big awakening. I feel a lot of joy. I feel a lot of, I don't know how to even say it. I just wanted to give you thanks for your opening, for your love, for the joy that you reflect and that is born in you. And this movie, I don't know, it opened like like everything, like, I don't know how to explain it. Everything, so many years I suffered for a lie, for something that I I invented, and for something that I gave reality to. I am the one that gives the power to the ego, and I believe in, in it. And I have been in psychiatrists, psychologists, and workshops, and so many things, trying to, to almost like to fight with something that doesn't exist. So I feel like today I woke up, I feel like this revelation, like I don't know how to tell you, but I feel totally different. I felt a lot of resistance to you before, because I would say, no, he's, how, how, what did I say before? It's like, he says too much truth, all the truth, and I didn't want to hear it. <laughs> it's like, I only wanted to keep on sleeping or something. And, but today I had all the opening, all the opening. And today I'm so happy and I really want to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Your face says it all. You're shining for the whole world. <laughs> yeah, we see your love and gratitude. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, next we can go to Silma. You can unmute there. Oh, first of all, I love all of you. It's been such a gift to be connected with you. And I realize how much I need to be connected because my journey with A Course in Miracles has been since 1982. And it's been a lonely journey because 
I, I hadn't found anyone who really could receive what I was gleaning. And uh, I've had a lot of resistance. And just the last uh, workshop, the, the first week in um, January, that workshop blew everything open for me. It was, it was incredible for me how it happened that I became aware of a thing about, I've been receiving poetry since the late 70s, 76. And it seemed like every poetry, it was like instructions, you know, it was beautiful poetry, but, but uh, something that one was the key to order, which was I was battling with order in my life because I've been HDH, HDHD or whatever you call it, ADHD all my life. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> so uh, that uh, workshop opened up something when I received that prayer of my heart. And it was such a piece of poetry that touched me so deeply every time I read it. It just bring tears. I would cry and cry and cry. And I thought, what is this? I couldn't understand. I wasn't unhappy. I was very happy. But it was something so deep. And what it was, it was a recognition that all this time that I had been asking and praying for guidance, I hadn't realized that I had been having guidance all along for years and years. And I just thought it was something else, you know. And uh, once that happened, (laughs) it was like the dam broke and every thought was in poetry. I'd be cooking and I would have to stop and run and jot down the stanza because if I didn't it would repeat in my head and over and over and over until I wrote it down and then it would leave me alone and I went like this for two weeks right after that workshop it was it was insane for me because it was (laughs) it was like please stop for a minute I need a break I need to do something (laughs) (laughs) but the, the poetry is all about um Course in Miracles recognitions and deep, profound truths, and, and it's so amazing. And my ego person cannot do that. I know this was from way above. And so I've been, uh, I hadn't even had time to catalog them all and put them together. Some of them are scribbled in a piece of paper, some in the computer. But what I have gleaned is that my, uh, my focus on wanting something so bad had blocked me from receiving it. It was like, Oh, please, please give me, give me. But I didn't recognize that I had been given all along not recognizing it. So I'm very grateful for your enlightened teachings from, for Francis, for Swaba, for uh, everyone in the community, Eric, everyone, everyone. I, I love you all so much. And I want to collaborate with you. And right now I'm telling you the ego, my ego has gone from very suspicious to very uh, malicious and vicious uh, because I have completely shifted into a, uh, to surrender, surrender, whatever is in the docket. And so I have a 100.5 year old aunt who fell and bruised herself badly, probably cracked a couple of ribs and stuff. So I've had to be in attendance of her. And then my little dog, I have three dogs, my little one, which is a dachshund. She's very, uh, I would just say she's very, um, aggressive in many ways anyway she got into a fight with my pit bull and got chewed up pretty bad so lately right before the workshop so i've had to do things for her and but my ego is not winning i'm dealing with it here and i'm here and i'm so grateful and i want to be in every single workshop because that's how i connect with my truth and i appreciate it thank you so much oh, thank you Silomar. You. Thank you. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay, David, yeah. well, it's half past now. Yeah, we've got a little, let's do a few more here if we can. Uh, yeah, sure. Keep going. 
Okay, great. Well, let's go to uh, Luz. You can unmute there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, David, um, I would have never, ever, ever in my life seen this movie except <laughs> in this context. Not ever. <laughs> as soon as I see dark images and this weird stuff, I just shift to something else. I'm glad you mentioned that and put emphasis on staying with you. But because, of course, with you, I can see anything. I know you will take me by the hand very softly. <laughs> and these images of this dark city are exactly, exactly the depiction of how I feel when the ego is bombarding me with thoughts about the body and the symptoms and the disease and whatnot. That's where I am in that very dark city. It's it's an amazing movie. I'm glad you showed it. And for the past couple of weeks, my prayer has been, please show me any thoughts, beliefs, experiences that I've had that are still waiting to be turned over to the Holy Spirit because something is keeping all this situation in the body or it would have been gone. So what do I have to let go? And in some of your interventions, you mentioned the trinity of the ego, shame, guilt, and fear. You were mentioning these three words and it, it popped into my mind. An experience I went through, maybe it's not even real, who knows, it's a memory I have, but it's very vivid. As a four-year-old, where I was playing with my little friend he would go, we were the same age, four or five, both of us. And he and I were in the garden in a very, like, secluded place. So he said, oh, if you show me yours, I'll show you mine. And I thought, sure, why not, you know? It was very innocent and transparent. And there was, it was not a big thing. But then a grown-up came by passed by and she told me oh wait I am going to tell your mom wow I still remember the intense fear the adrenaline rushing the guilt the profound shame which before that comment that none of that was present it was just you know looking at something like looking at the grass or whatever. But the charge of this comment really was devastating for me as a four-year-old. And I'm sure that's what's behind this. And I've worked, I remember saying this to my psychoanalyst many years back, but he didn't think much of it, nor did I, you know, it was just, an experience, but oh my God, all this intense shame and fear and guilt are probably still there in the mind and they are creating all this craziness. So thank you. Deep gratitude for you picking this movie. Thank you, David. Thank you, Luz. Thank you. Yeah, I think that when we come to this world, part of the part of the program that's very deep is this idea of pleasing mom, pleasing dad, and and a comment like that it 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 triggers the this vulnerability feeling and fear that I could let down one of the ones that I'm not supposed to let down, 
like uh, that's that's just part of the programming. But I do remember when you came uh, in March uh, of was it last year and and were able to come in and open up uh, very very candidly, even about uh, the body symptoms and everything. I do feel like that is the movement towards healing the need for approval or pleasing anyone where we can just tell it like it is or as it seems to come to us with with so much permission and so much allowance. And I feel like that's the, the this is a safe place for that uh, because in speaking it, uh, then we start to allow it uh, allow that, that fear maybe that was pushed away to to come up and to clear, to pass through. And that's really the prayer of your heart, is that that whatever is, is still buried uh, come is freely come up into awareness for release. And uh, and I think you are aware that that's kind of how it works with body symptoms when when the body seems to suffer, it's because it's covering the mind suffering. And now we're giving ourselves a way out of that mind suffering, which is a transparency. And so thank you for, uh, for sharing what you did and being a part of these experiences. And I'm glad if the movie helped, helped along with that, because sometimes people can feel like that's their personal hell. And um, when you see it on the big screen like this, it, it starts to give it a different uh, context. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, next we can go to uh, Furman. You can unmute there. Furman Ladron. Hi, good night, David. I want to thank you for the teaching. It's the first time I see this movie. And I I wouldn't have seen it like the lady just mentioned because it would have been very hard for me to understand it. I've been doing the course for about three or four years, but I haven't read the text. I have a lot of resistance. To This year I started doing the lessons again without a group in WhatsApp, Little by little, I do the best that I can. And I'm also doing a lot of meetings because I've been, I've been spending years. It almost feels like in another life I was a Buddhist monk and I was, I've been in Buddhism for many years with a lot of energy. And I carry many things at the same time. I've been Catholic, Christian, evangelist, Reiki, Course in Miracles. But it seems that you have motivated me so much with these teachings and with this movie that the, I have realized that I'm starting to see the light. I see that Buddhism doesn't really convince me for two things. First, they don't talk about God. He doesn't talk about, they talk about Buddha, suffering is very similar, that peace, meditation, love, compassion. But some th I still miss that it doesn't talk about God. And then I see like Christianism with karma, that they say, no, that's very scientific. And they, they do a lot of fear of being born again, something that I don't like. And when I see this arrogance, when I see a teacher with a beautiful teaching that there's 20 years with a teacher that brought Buddhism of Tibet, and I see like he's in fear with the pandemic. And I said, give me a hug. And she's like, oh, no, 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 the, the mask and everything. And since I've been in the course, I have thoughts and beliefs of feeling lonely. And that's why I protect my children and I help them too much. That creates the opposite effect. They reject sometimes problems. And I have seen the movie about the injection of the memories and the beliefs and of this unconscious mind that they're doing that they, you stay in the ego, that you suffer. 
and not finding it hard to ask for guidance, to forgive, and that's what it says, that I can make a decision to the moment to awake. I don't see it as easy. I would also like to, if you could please comment to me about a few of your books, of which of your book that's easy so that I can start with a course. And really, definitely, I think that Buddhism, I'm going to, yeah, the meditation is good, but like religion and, well, yeah, yeah, I asked Buddha, and, but it's keeping me away from Jesus, the path of Jesus, that I, it's what the one that I've always felt. And I just wanted to know your opinion, basically. Thank you so much for everything. Mm. Yes, thank you for sharing your heart and and sharing your journey uh, that you've come through so many steps and and phases. I think um, the the English wording is "This moment is your miracle," but there's a, a Spanish translation. I'm sure Anna can can give you uh, of that book. That's the book I would um, go go with because it has. Uh, the beautiful teachings, but also lovely examples, and even some exercises uh, to do uh, with every chapter. So it has an experiential uh, component to it as well. I think that will be the the book that will gently lead you towards this uh, this calling that you feel now. And I always feel like it's a time of happiness and joy when someone really discovers uh, an, like a pathway that they feel in their heart. Uh, because what you describe is very common, where people will try out many things to find something that really touches their heart, really resonates. So, yes, I'm so glad that you're with us on this retreat, and uh, I hope that Myself and our our team, we can be uh, of assistance to you uh, if you, as you move along in this journey, and you have any kind of questions or uh, you would like uh, like to have contact with us. This is a beautiful, beautiful opening, and yeah, we're just very honored. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And next, we can go to uh, Shadi. You can unmute. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this movie so much. The first time I watched it was just a few months ago, and I didn't get it. I just kind of scratched my head and said, could hardly see anything. It's so dark. <laughs> but this, you <laughs> everything and it was so so wonderful i had a couple of friends over and everybody was in shock and i was kind of inside going yes yes <laughs> these moments of joy <laughs> anyway i uh, my question is i'm a student of the course for the past year i finished it i started it last year and i finished it by the end of the year i'm new to it i'm coming from a student of Taoism to the course but i feel course has catapulted me to totally different place I um and I question the things that I do now um I uh, I lead a kindness movement in Laguna Beach I have a nonprofit. I teach kids about bullying prevention and how to be kind I t- teach kindness and compassion and how to be a friend and tolerance and all of that and I am questioning I'm still doing them, but I, my, my purpose has changed so much. I don't feel like I'm doing it because I want to change the world. I don't think there's anything wrong with the world. I think we have to be here in this whole nightmare to learn what we need to learn. I don't want to take away the nightmare. However, I think that as children are coming to this life, they, their experience is we teach them, this is your body. You know, you, your body will get hurt if you touch the fire. You know, we want to take care of our body. We feed, we feed them. And it's all about body. And then when they're teenagers and say, my body is my body, you stay out of it. We can't really say, oh, no, it's not actually. <laughs> it's, it's what we've been teaching them all along. And it's just 
I, I think I want to see what comes to you as far as what we could teach children or should we not teach them anything and let them be in this world and have them just go through the process and experience and um, what comes to you with that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think it's always best to to remind ourselves that it's always our, our own lesson. In fact, um, in the early years, it was like Jesus was in my mind, like a broken record, uh, saying, it's your lesson. It's your lesson. I mean, this would go on for weeks. It's your lesson. It's your lesson. And in terms of children, um, if you're working with children, what a great opportunity and discipline um, instead of being like uh, a Buddhist monk who sits for six, seven, eight hours a day and has uh, someone come with a little stick to hit them when they start to nod off in meditation, uh, you just work with children. Uh, it, it's a different kind of stick, uh, but uh, it's good attentiveness practice. Because we teach beyond our examples in terms of the body, it's our attitude that is always teaching. And children are very cued in to the attitude. Um, if, if you're not there 100% or your actions are not in alignment with your attitude, they will poke, 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 like the, the Buddhist stick. They will poke, poke, poke at you. Uh, which is beautiful. Uh, in terms of teaching kindness, that that is beautiful too, because that is in alignment with your mind training. Because the kindness, true, genuine kindness, can come from a sense of non-judgment. And non-judgment implies acceptance. You really have to be accepting. You also develop patience uh, in those kind of situations. And I have found that when I have been around children, it has been a very rich uh, opportunity for uh, really practicing living the Course. Uh, because you, you can't just throw a concept at them, or, or throw some words. Uh, you know, that's not going to work. So, I would say you're right where you, you're meant to be. It's so beautiful that you feel excitement with, after one year with the Course. Uh, this is also very common where you need to gain a, a momentum and a confidence that will carry you uh, as you go much deeper. And, and this period of building your confidence with the Course is, is so important. Some people call it the honeymoon phase with the Course. And, and I'm like, absolutely, yes. And, and that's absolutely there for a reason. Because we need the, we need the confidence and momentum to, to go forward as we keep going deeper and deeper with it. And at the beginning, it's not so important to be concerned about changing, you know, your situation or your job. Um, it's, Jesus tells us the, the, the first change that's required is a change in attitude. So, he focuses on our mind and our content of, of our emotions. And then he says, things will unfold. You know, it'll all be shown to you and you'll be taken care of beautifully. But, but focused mostly on paying attention to your emotions and, and, and your thoughts, which most of us were not conditioned to do. I know in my family I wasn't taught to pay attention to my emotions and thoughts. It was all about do's and don'ts. 
And when I was a little boy, I actually thought my name was David Don't. <laughs> I thought I thought Don't was my last name because I I heard those two words together <laughs> so many times. David Don't. David Don't. So, you know, you're going the other direction, you know, towards kindness, towards openness, acceptance. And that will be very felt by by your mirrors. Your, you know, your mirrors will reflect that back to you. And and it's actually quite, uh, quite beautiful. So I'm glad you're excited. I'm glad this uh, movie really, really touched something inside. And I'm I'm glad that the the commentary and the whole context was able to to really touch you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well we can go with uh death. You can uh unmute there. Hola, buen noite, David. Good evening, David. I'm very happy to be talking to you today and I would like to tell my experience watching the movie with you because um, even if it was very dark all of that then uh, you always came and we were talking and then there came the light and awareness and I could know that there there was a safe heaven that I didn't have to be afraid. And I'm talking like this because I've been having a relationship with Jesus in this way, and sometimes I'm living situations that are difficult, but I feel that he's there. And then I go to silence, and then everything that I need to know comes to my awareness. And I would like to ask you, David, because today I was talking to my mom and she was crying because of the world situation, the pandemic. And I was also talking to other friends and everybody was suffering a lot. And I cannot feel this suffering. I cannot give it a meaning to all of this that is happening in the world. And I don't know if I fell, but I, I have a doubt because my mind insists maybe you are insensible. Maybe do you really believe it's a way? How do you feel? How can you just not feel the the suffering of all these people? But I can't. I can't give meaning to all of that. So, yeah. So a big kiss to you and thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that is a, a good example of, of an opening to true empathy which Jesus says can be the most difficult thing to grasp, but that I feel is, is the most important, uh, to start to realize that, that what you feel is your filter and perception of the world. As you feel peace, you radiate peace to the world. As you feel connected to Jesus, you bring that light to everyone and everything. And only the ego would would doubt this beautiful uh, devotion, uh, because the ego's one a- attempt is to try to make the error real, and a version of making the error real is to is to see suffering without suffering in the world is uh, is part of a misperception in the workbook 